Good morning and welcome to this uh, very special workshop on behavior change and awareness campaigns held under the auspices of the IEA's Energy Efficiency Working Party. In the room, we are joined by a number of IEA Energy Efficiency Working Party members, and we're very lucky to welcome participants from around the world watching our broadcast on the live stream of the IEA's YouTube channel and events page. The topic for today is certainly timely as governments around the world are having to manage a crisis of energy supply and energy affordability. Unfortunately, many of the me measures needed to tackle this crisis are taking or do take a long time to design and implement. Because of this, governments are looking to their citizens to reduce their own energy demand and are developing behavior change and awareness campaigns to communicate with citizens about energy use and conservation. In the opening session of this workshop, we are going to ask what is the value of awareness campaigns as a crisis response tool and how are they being used to deliver energy demand reductions in the very short term. We will hear from governments who have responded to crises in the past and others that are developing these campaigns now so that we can understand how best to design and implement them effectively. So for online participants, I'll ask you to leave your microphones off to avoid feedback and background noises. And before we start, I'll ask Brian Motherway, uh, Dr. Brian Motherway, IEA Head of Energy Efficiency to provide some opening remarks. Thank you, Abla. Um, good morning, friends and colleagues uh, here in the room and joining us online. We're delighted to be speaking to you all today. We're very pleased to be hosting this workshop. Thank you, Abla, for agreeing to chair it. And thank you so many people for joining us in person and online. As um, Abla has said, this is a really important and timely topic. We know from our work with governments around the world that there's a lot of focus on energy demand, energy prices, energy security. We all understand why that's happening at the moment. Uh, and we all understand the importance of it. This is not just an energy policy issue, but it's about people and their well-being and the affordability of energy and their comfort and well-being at home, the ability to drive our economies, the ability to keep people uh, moving and working and comfortable and healthy. And governments are rightly focused on issues that they can take in both the short term and the longer term to help enable that, while also uh, keeping in mind our equally urgent challenges relating to climate change uh, and the pathway towards clean energy and net zero transitions. It's certainly speaking for myself, it's pleasing to see so many governments reacting with firmness, with many strong uh, policies moving quickly, but also with a sense of solidarity, a sense of governments working together uh, and uniting to address these issues, which really represent possibly the most significant global all of energy crisis the world has, has ever faced, certainly in modern times. Um, and of course, aging, engaging people is central to that. The, the issue about how we talk to citizens, how governments help empower citizens uh, and businesses to understand how they can control their energy costs, how they can remain comfortable uh, and healthy while reducing the, the amount of money they spend on energy, the amount of energy they use, which of course helps citizens directly, but also helps societies as a whole uh, in terms of resilience and energy security, which is going to be a challenge in many parts of the world as we we roll into the winter here in Europe and elsewhere, uh, there will be challenges. And I think the societal debate around this is very heightened and countries are, and individuals are aware of these issues. So working with governments around the world, we've been looking at the ways that governments choose to engage with citizens in terms of energy use, energy behavior. And we see a lot of successes. Uh, we also see a lot of What's the opposite of success in a more euphemistic word than failure? I suppose failures is the word I'm looking for. Uh, sometimes this doesn't work. Sometimes uh, campaigns are maybe not well designed or not well delivered, and we learn lessons from that. And we're going to talk about those lessons today. We're going to understand some of the principles we see around the many examples from every part of the world in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And there are some cross-cutting principles, and my colleagues will talk about those later, as will our many excellent guest speakers. We know that this is not just a rational, factual, thing you don't just tell a citizen did you know uh, if you turn something off you save some money that is certainly part of it information is part of it but we know that narratives matter context matter messaging really matters particularly in these times where these issues are very sensitive many people are rightly very worried about about keeping themselves warm in this winter or cool in the coming season and therefore the way 
campaigns talk to citizens really matters uh, in terms of of supporting citizens and empowering them to make choices that that can help them so design really matters careful design really matters and that's why we've learned that that involving experts in behavior change involving experts from social science from different disciplines from communications really can make a difference and you'll see that uh, throughout the course of this workshop this is a topic we continue to work on here in the IEA. We'd love to hear from all of you if you have suggestions, if you have examples that have worked or not worked, if you have comments on what we're doing. We'll be publishing more on this topic uh, later this year. So we're very keen to continue to engage with you all. Uh, so to, do please get in touch during the course of this workshop or afterwards. We'd love to continue the conversation. So I hope uh, everybody enjoys the day. I think it's going to be really interesting presentations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian. So I'll start by introducing the first three speakers we have planned for the morning. Mr. Kanama Ogawa, Director, Electricity Infrastructure Division, uh, Japanese Ministry of Energy, Trade and Industry. After that, uh, we'll hear from Ms. Gawon Kim from the Korean Energy Agency and Ms. Samira Souza, General Coordinator for the Energy Efficiency at the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy. So I'll uh, pass it over to Mr. Ogawa. Okay, um, hello, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, this is Ogawa and uh, um, thank you for uh, this occasion. And it's a great pleasure to be here to share our experience of the latest power crisis, re crisis response in Japan. Um, let me start by um, briefly explaining what happened this year in Japan. At first, um, March in March, um, our a powerful earthquake hit a week earlier, uh, followed by an unusually low temperature with cold rain and snow. Um, these two um, reasons brought uh, the the, the power crunch alert for the first time. Um, Japan has been a, a long time um, energy conservation um, country uh, since um, the oil crisis in 1970s, but those are, I would say, the everyday conservation, meaning that um, it's a, a lasting campaign, whereas this time it is an emergency campaign so uh, we, the crisis was there and we needed to ask the citizens to um, conserve energy immediately. And that was the very first time to issue uh, this kind of power crunch alert for our government. That was the first time, but um, um, surprisingly, we had to issue a similar advisory in June. Um, this was also unusual in the sense that um, the, the record breaking high temperature uh, of 35 degrees or more. It is so unusual that the meteorological agency said that uh, it is the first time in a hundred years. So the, we, the, the electricity companies were not prepared for this record-breaking um, power demand. And this time, it was not an alert, but an advisory, but lasted for a week. And in the end, we fortunately avoided the, the power outage. Um, before um, explaining the details of our campaign, I'd like you to explain the the background or the situation in Japan. Firstly, grid constraints. Um, you see Tokyo uh, metropolitan area in the, the blue color. Uh, this is the, where the crisis took place and the largest um, area with a population of 45 million. In Japan, there are as many as 10 TSOs and though the areas are connected with interconnections, but as you see here, uh, interconnection capacity is still limited. And uh, so at the time of crisis, um, all other areas, um, the, the power generate and um, 
it is transferred to the Tokyo area, but there is a limitation. That is the first point. And secondly, um, historical reasons. Um, here you see the peak demand um, in March in Tokyo or a typical area. Uh, but uh, after the great um, East Japan earthquake in 2011, uh, the demand declined almost by 10% or five gigawatts. That is huge decline. And that is largely due to electricity conservation. What happened immediately after the earthquake was that um, the government, um, there is a mandatory energy conservation for industry users as much as 15%. And citizens also voluntarily um, conserved energy by almost uh, over 10%. And that effect continued for several years. And it recently, um, the effect is declining, but still um, there is a decline. But this year, uh, as you see here on the graph, the record breaking um, demand was registered. And this is the day of the power crisis. Um, the red um, line shows the, the estimate power saving. Without uh, this power saving, um, the Tokyo area, area would have been blocked out, as you see here. What you see here is that the line, blue line, shows the, the pump up hydro capacity. And uh, because all other uh, power plants were in full capacity, uh, the remaining uh, supply capacity was this pump up hydro all together with as much as 10 gigawatts. And once this uh, hydro is depleted, this means that there is no um, supply power to make up for the demand. So this was a real crisis. And uh, every hour, uh, the TEPCO TSO uh, issued a notice uh, indicating the remaining capacity. Um, the red, uh, red character shows that uh, at night, the pump up hydro would be depleted, meaning that there is going to be a blackout. And also um, in the afternoon, our minister held an emergency press conference uh, asking um, uh, the entire citizen to um, conserve electricity. That was uh, very effective and all the media reported um, of course, um, with uh, lights uh, off, and uh, that, that that saved our uh, area uh, on in March. And this is uh, power saving um, the, the segment by segments. Um, as you see, it, it, the household accounts for about half, so it is crucial to um, ask citizens to save energy. But um, at the same time, it wouldn't be have been 10% or 15%, rather in total 3%, uh, and some, at some time 6%. That's the maximum we estimate. The, this is the power crunch alert mechanism. Um, in March, there is only one um, alert system. This is uh, when the expected reserve margin below 3%. But in order to raise the awareness of the power crisis, we introduced a new measure of this advisory, power crunch advisory with uh, the margin below 5%. And in order to give enough time to prepare, uh, we decided to issue a notice um, two days ahead. Those are the measures introduced after much crisis and in June, it certainly worked. This is a brief com um, comparison between March alerts and June advisory, and the awareness was raised. Uh, but at the same time, because in June, it was an advisory, not an alert, uh, those who took action to save power was uh, relatively um, a few uh, compared with in March. 
but in the, it shows that how um, the important it is to um, uh, give enough time to prepare and raise awareness of the public. This is the response by industrial users in June, where when the power crunch advisory lasted for a week. And as you see on the graph, um, the, the number of users that took action naturally uh, declined. So it is um, crucial how to maintain the effects of energy conservation efforts, not only by industry users, but also by um, the citizens. Let me conclude the lessons that we learned from the crisis of this year. Firstly, the electricity conservation is an effect, and I would say it's the, the last measure to avoid um, the power outage. And secondly, um, the industries and the household are two pillars of electricity conservation. But the big difference is that industry uh, has an, uh, can work with an economic incentives such as um, demand response, but um, the vis a vis the citizens, uh, the, uh, we, it's not an economic incentive, rather, uh, the raising the awareness is of the of importance. And uh, thirdly, it's not limited to industrial users, but we give enough time to prepare for taking actions. And fourthly, uh, media plays a crucial role. So not only homepage, but also uh, via um, SNS, and also um, the traditional way of emergency press conference was also effective. And the fifth point, as I pointed out, um, the longer the campaign continues, the less the, the effect will be. Okay, so uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. And I'd like to take um, questions after other speakers' uh, presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll pass it now over to Ms. Kim. Good morning. Um, I am a senior manager, Kim Gayon, from the Demand Side Policy Division of Korea Energy Agency. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is measures to reduce energy demand and enhance efficiency to respond to the energy crisis in Korea. Um, since the oil crisis, do we have the presentation? No? Oh, okay. the, the oil crisis in the 1970s, Korea has been pushing for energy saving measures to cope with the crisis brought by the higher oil prices. Also, in the wake of the massive power outage on, 9, on 15 September 2011, we have been focusing on energy demand management measures aimed at stabilizing the power supply and demand. Korea's drastic summer heat waves during um, bring the temperature up to 40 degrees Celsius, while they are suddenly dropped to minus 15 degrees Celsius winter. Due to this distinct weather pattern, the energy supply during summer and winter time increases rapidly resulting in maximum electricity peaks. Um, electricity peak levels have been continuously increasing for the past decade. While we could ease the peak burden by expanding the supply, it is difficult and costly to build new supply, um, supply facilities within a short time. Therefore, the cost-effective and optimal answer would be to pursue measures to reduce energy demand and boost energy efficiency, which will alleviate the power peak issues. Um, now, let me go into the details of measures to reduce energy demand and improve energy efficiency during this summer. Our focus was to run nationwide 
promotional events and campaigns to spread the culture of voluntary participation in energy saving. We created the slogan, we are the net zero generation that cherishes the earth. This slogan means participating energy efficiency could contribute to, to carbon neutrality. Um, under this slogan, K-pop star influences made dancing and singing videos carrying the message of energy efficiency innovation. In turn, citizens participated in the energy challenge event, copying the net zero generation dance and posting the videos on YouTube and Instagrams. We have recorded 323 videos and 747 participants. In addition, we utilized the famous characters from Korea's dominant messenger platform, Kakao, to create and distribute images illustrating energy saving and everyday practice. This led to better promotional effect on various ways to reduce energy in daily life. So 40,000 um, images sets were in distributed and the entire quantity was exhausted only within two hours and 45 minutes. Also, we ran an online campaign titled 10 Practice for Wise Energy Life on the Kakao platform, which included using high efficiency grade one products. The campaign recorded approximately 21,000 participants. Um, we have also operated more than three street campaigns from July to August with the civic groups across 15 provinces and cities. We encourage stores and citizens to take part in the keep minimum temperature of 26 degrees Celsius for indoors air conditioning on with the doors closed and efficient energy usage campaigns in major commercial areas in the cities. Not only that, we operated the energy saving joint campaign with the franchise brands. We sent out energy saving videos on the digital screens in uh, 53,000 branches with distribution franchises, such as convenience stores, where citizens have everyday access. We focused on also spreading the message of energy efficiency to as many citizens as possible by utilizing various media channels. We created a public advertisement containing the energy efficiency innovation message and aired the ad on TV, in newspaper, on express railways and buses, etc., to reach more people. Moreover, we created video cartoons about energy saving in households, offices, and stores with fun and interesting plots and posted on YouTube to make the idea of energy saving easier and more approachable for the citizens. We also provided information on energy saving by utilizing the energy saving quiz event in a popular radio channel's listener quiz section. Um, to save also household electricity, we operated the incentive program, the 333 program for electricity saving and energy cashback. The 333 program for electricity saving aims to save 3% of electricity with three actions in a three, three months period. We grant for um, volunteer work hours to participants who have completed practicing energy saving activities at home, promoting energy saving and taking the electricity saving performance tasks the energy cashback program returns cashback to the apartment complexes or households that have significantly reduced energy um, electricity usage mm -hmm. compared to their neighboring counterparts, pro proportionate to the reduced power usage amount. A pilot version of this project was operated in three cities earlier this year. 
it recorded our uh, average energy reduction rate of 14.1% per household and saved a total of 779 megawatt hour. Because it was highly effective in energy saving, we have expanded the scope to nationwide since July to save more power during summer time. Um, it is important for public organizations to take initiatives in energy efficiency actions. We made it mandatory for public organizations to comply with the minimum 28 degrees Celsius indoor temperature, use lighting equipment efficiently, and control elevator operations and reduce standby power. And we checked for the, their compliances. Lastly, we recommended public organizations and business that use much energy to consecutively suspend air conditioning during summer, during summer and disperse the summer vacation schedules. The conservative suspension of air conditioning recommends a temporary shutdown of air conditioning facilities or minimizing their load during peak electricity hours across the six regions nationwide. When the supply um, power supply crisis stage is declared, the dispersion of a summer vacation recommends people spread out their holiday schedules. In the first three weeks of August, the estima estimated electricity peak for 2022. Thanks to these um, demand management measures to respond to the power crisis, we could stabilize the electricity supply this summer. Um, the real concern is the upcoming winter. We are expecting an energy crisis, such as the shortage of natural gas and a spike um, in the energy prices by the Russia-Ukraine war. The government, therefore, is reviewing much stronger measures to reduce energy usage in winter. Again, public organizations should take the initiative in energy saving. We are reviewing the implementation of five energy saving initiatives during winter time. Especially, we have a lower the heating temperature threshold from the original 18 degrees Celsius to 17 degrees Celsius to further push for more energy saving. In addition, to expand the public participation in energy saving, we will run promotion events and campaigns such as reducing 10% of energy in winter time and turning on the heat with the doors closed and wearing warm inner wear in winter. We also plan to include not only the electricity but also the gas sector in the energy cashback program. The response measures for the winter energy crisis that I have just aligned are currently under review. So please note that the details are subject to change. Well, it was very interesting to hear about the Japanese government's the energy crisis response um, measures. And I'm also looking forward to learning more about energy efficiency and demand reduction campaigns in Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands and Italy after my presentation. Um, let me wrap up today's presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that. I'm sorry we didn't get to see your deck, but I'm sure it was lovely. Our next speaker is joining us from Brazil and I'm not sure, oh, there you are. Wonderful. So we are lucky to be joined by Samira Souza. General Coordinator for Energy Efficiency at the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy. And she's gonna to speak to us about Brazil's response to the hydropower crisis. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing with you some of our uh, initiatives in Brazil. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity of sharing uh, with you some of our uh, initiatives uh, in terms of awareness campaigns and also uh, incentive programs to stimulate energy consumption and reduction as a measure to respond to the energy crisis the crowd country has uh, faced recently. Uh, As you may know, uh, Brazil has a very uh, uh, hydraulic energy matrix. And uh, if you uh, can compare, we have uh, we have a, a very first um, uh, worst uh, ration in, in 2001. And uh, in 2021, we had uh, uh, another very worst uh, hydraulic period, uh, and for the second time, we have uh, went through a very critical uh, season, uh, as we have seven years of uh, no uh, uh, affluent uh, energy, as we can call the Yamamba water, the richest the hydroelectric, hydroelectric plants uh, in the southeast and midwest. Uh, system and also in the Northeast system in relation to the historical average for the series. So uh, we have this uh, very critical period this, uh, this time, uh, even in comparison with the uh, 2001 crisis. But uh, as we you can see, the uh, matrix, uh, energy electricity uh, matrix, matrix in Brazil had uh, 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 improved a lot in these 20 years. Uh, we have installed, uh, improved the installed capacity in 112 gigawatts, and we have uh, uh, reduced uh, a lot the dependence of hydraulic uh, power, uh, but we still have 57% uh, uh, of hydraulic power and to uh, as a uh, supply of our matrix. We also have expanded a lot the transmission lines, the transmission system improved to 90, almost 95,000 kilometers in these 20 years. So the conditions to, to fight with this crisis this year was a very uh, much more, uh, much uh, better than the uh, situation in 2001. Uh, uh, even though we have a very complex uh, system of uh, work, uh, we have uh, since 2001, we have a committee, uh, the electric sector monitoring committee that has uh, monthly uh, the, the job to uh, monitor the system and how the, uh, the electric system is being operated together with all these institutions uh, that uh, uh, help to uh, identify the most critical uh, situations and uh, organize the measures to uh, uh, avoid any uh, power shortage. So uh, in this situation, uh, recent situation, since September 2020, the committee has held regular month meetings and weekly technical meetings involving the uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy and human buyers that work in the planning, operation, regulation, and commercialization of energy, in addition to other invited institutions, such as the Water National uh, Regulatory Agency and also the uh, Institute for uh, Environmental Resources in Brazil. In the meetings, aim to monitor the conditions of electric, electricity supply and coordinate actions among the institutions, uh, supporting the uh, sector committee uh, resolutions. Uh, for this time, uh, the uh, committee has held a lot of uh, different decisions, including also uh, the uh, uh, organization and uh, bringing some institutions together to uh, promote campaigns for conscious 
and there is a no consumption of water and electricity. Uh, because also uh, of the crisis, uh, uh, there was uh, it was created this uh, special committee, uh, uh, exceptional uh, committee for uh, uh, regulatory measures also to to fight against the, the most uh, worst uh, situations uh, and also this community uh, this committee has uh, brought decisions uh, uh, a very long list of decisions and uh, this committee uh, has uh, defined also the uh, implementation of incentive program incentive programs for the voluntary reduction of uh, at consumption applicable to regulated consumers and also uh, for free market consumers yeah. for economic incentives. So uh, in comparison with 2021, different from the response uh, for death crisis when uh, severe rationing was established to all the consumers, with penalties to those which extrapolated and find maximum consumption. Now in 2021, the option was for incentive programs and awareness campaigns. The objective this time was to avoid the purchase or dispatch of emergency electricity, which is much more expensive. So uh, following the recommendations of these two committees, uh, some awareness campaigns were developed uh, by different agents, all under the coordination of uh, CS, CS, CMSE, uh, the Electric Sector Monitoring Committee, Monitoring Committee, and following the standards defined by the Secretary of Communication of the Presidency of the Republic. Uh, so under the slogan, conscious consumption now, and also electricity, if it is wasted, it is going to miss. Uh, the Secretary of Communication produce, produced a, a both labs with recommendations for energy and water conservation, as well as materials to, to social media. Uh, all the institutions involved in the uh, monitoring the uh, energy crisis uh, were involved in this campaign and uh, were distributed and uh, shown also in their websites all these materials. Uh, also, under the energy efficiency uh, program regulated by ANEL, the Association of Electricity Distribution Companies, ABAD, uh, invested around $18 million in a nationwide campaign, uh, which involved the participation of 135 digital influencers. Uh, uh, the promotion of approximately production of approximately 500 communication pieces and 24 videos for the TV, digital, and mobile. Uh, and also the national program for electricity conservation, Procell program, uh, developed an awareness campaign. Uh, the Procell program has a regular. Uh, awareness campaigns for energy saving, but at uh, this time, this campaign was also uh, aligned with the standards of uh, that CEPOM provided. And uh, produced also material for social media, so such as this cards in the right side, and uh, uh, videos for TV and internet, as well as radio and uh, audios for radio and podcasts. Uh, as for sales, CEO is a very well-recognized brand in Brazil. Uh, it improved the confidence of the consumers uh, regarding the information being uh, uh, provided. And also, uh, but, uh, the, the incentive uh, programs to, to uh, encourage the voluntary reduction of electricity uh, energy consumption were developed uh, both in the free market and the regulated market 
so that they could voluntarily reduce their consumption, generating a reduction in energy demand at a much lower cost than would be uh, uh, incurred uh, to cover possible extra demand. For the free market consumers, the mechanism uh, were based or uh, was based on the free participation of all the different agents uh, operating in the free market. Uh, the consumers in this case should uh, offer in advance a volume of reduction uh, on five megawatt batches duration, uh, uh, five megawatt batches, uh, a duration between four and seven hours and a price in reais per megawatt hour to reduce the demand. And if it's approved, it was a, a necessary comply with at least 80% of the reduction offered. Uh, for the consumers in the regulated market, uh, the mechanism based uh, was based on economic incentives. So the uh, they uh, could uh, uh, the government would launch the uh, 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 duration for this incentive from September to. Uh, 2021, uh, September to, to December of 2021. And the consumers in this case, uh, which managed to reduce consumption by up to 10%, uh, would be rewarded with a bonus of uh, $10 for every 100 uh, kilowatt hour saved. Uh, this initiative uh, contributed, has contributed for savings of 5.6 million megawatt hour in the period, which represents a reduction of 4.5% in the energy bill of the residential consumers. Uh, also considering uh, the relevance of the public sector as a vector of, uh, for the market in terms of promoting energy efficiency measures, uh, the government uh, published last year the decree 10,779, which established measures to, do, uh, to reduce electricity consumption in federal public administration. Uh, it defined the obligation of creation of internal committees of energy conservation in each public institution responsible for supporting the adoption of the indicated measures. The establishment of these internal committees uh, means an important step to consolidate energy management system integrate, uh, systems integrated to other managing operational activities of public buildings. Several guidelines focused on main energy end users and occupant behavior are indicated, or were indicated in the decree, such as restrictions on, uh, on the period of use of air conditioners, air conditioners set up temperature indicators, natural ventilation strategies, and energy efficient uh, lighting equipment. According to the terms of this decree, all federal, instit federal institutions would have to achieve at least 10% uh, of energy savings compared to the levels of 2019 data. Uh, a monitoring system uh, developed by the Ministry of Economy uh, that uh, coordinates and uh, is responsible for the uh, energy use in all the public buildings, uh, evaluated that the average energy consumption reduction reported by institutions was of 25% uh, in relation to the average consumption in 2018 and 2019 pre-pandemic levels. The, both initiatives have the character of being temporary, but the energy efficiency recommended measures have the potential of being permanently adopted once the results become concrete and are comprehended by the community. This is why systematic monitoring and the report of the results is fundamental in this case. In the sense, uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy is evaluating to propose a revision of the decree for public administration in order to extend the benefits of these measures uh, 
maybe we can do some of them uh, permanently. And also for the case of evaluating the permanence of the results of bonus programs, uh, we are evaluating the performance of the energy demand in different sectors. Uh, the June edition of the monthly energy bulletin uh, that's elaborated by the Ministry of Mines and Energy showed that the electricity consumption uh, remains in the spotlight. Uh, with, uh, the electricity consumption has grown little uh, compared to the previous year. Uh, it grew 1.6% over June 2021 and 1.9% in 2022, uh, late in the year. Uh, the commercial consumption uh, remains in the spotlight with a, a, big, a big increase uh, of around 9% this year, but uh, the residential consumption grew uh, in 2022 just 0.5%. And also the industrial consumption, consumption increased just 0.2% this year. And a rough analysis, analysis, it seems that the awareness campaigns have, uh, have been, uh, uh, some awareness has been created. Uh, but uh, it's obvious that the increase or not of energy demand depends on certain water uh, variables and social economic frameworks. So uh, for us, data collection and evaluation must be much more consistent to analyze the results of these measures and campaigns. And in this sense, uh, we are very pleased to count on so the support of IA to improve data collection uh, for energy efficiency in Brazil and uh, the cooperation that uh, is ongoing with the Energy Research Office and the EE is being very fruitful. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Samira, and a special thank you for joining us so early in Brazil. Um, our next four speakers are going to talk about work that they are doing um, on current the current energy uh, awareness campaigns. So we'll start with Louise Jensen Vogt from the Danish Ministry of Climate, Energy, and Utilities. Yes, um, my name is Louise Jensen and I'm working on behavioral and awareness campaigns at the Danish Energy Efficiency uh, Agency, sorry. And I thank you for this opportunity uh, to share our experience. And I'm going to talk with you today about uh, a behavioral campaign that we're doing in Denmark right now. Oh, yes, there was the right slide. So our current energy situation in Denmark calls for a reduction in our energy consumption. And one way to do so uh, is by um, doing behavioral campaigns. And that is one mean of action, one initiative that we're doing in Denmark. And um, we're doing a campaign that's running throughout the entire year. And our purpose with this campaign is to encourage the Danes to save energy and home and at their workplace. The research and the insight work that we did beforehand, this campaign showed that there was three primary drivers for saving energy, at least for the Danes. And it was economy, energy security, and climate. And the fact that they can contribute to the energy security. And what has been very interesting to see throughout this campaign is the shift in the drivers along as the situation is changing. Back in March, when we were doing a lot of the insights and research work, um, we saw that the uh, energy security driver was quite high. And that was, uh, of course, due to the context with the war in Ukraine. And uh, then later on, we did a user test in June, just before we launched the first part of the campaign, where we saw that it wasn't so high. The economy was the primary driver. And this just proves that it can be a hard situation to navigate in. Um, and I'll come back to that because we did some learnings on that part. Um, but for now and throughout the entire campaign, the economy has been a high driver because the prices are very high on energy in Denmark. So just a bit about the key message 
for the campaign is that together we can reduce our use. The key message overall is that we all need to play a part in the energy savings. We can't do, we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. Yes. And then I want to take you through some of the phases of the campaign. Uh, the first phase was the launch. We launched the campaign just before summer. And our main focus throughout the campaign is to provide seasonal tips and advice on how to save energy at home and at their workplace. This is to ensure that the Danes get uh, tips that will match the situation because many of these advice has been uh, the same for many years since the uh, oil crisis. So we needed to put it in a context that people can relate to. So during the summer, our advice was focused on electricity savings and tips such as drying your clothes outside instead of using your dryer and unplug all of your devices before leaving for holiday. And then we also had a focus on using the electricity when it's the greenest and the cheapest, which is when there's plenty of wind and solar energy in Denmark. So now we're in the second phase and our focus is to prepare for the heating season. We have some uh, focus on preparing your home for winter by introducing energy efficient solutions such as energy renovation. And um, we also just started a targeted campaign towards workplaces. I will come back to that. And the last phase for the campaign is the heating season. So we have uh, the heating season is, is coming. And uh, when it begins, it's not as it's a specific date, but we're working with it uh, like that. So when it begins, we will focus more on heating savings. Still, as you can see, we will also focus on electricity savings and hot water savings, but our primary focus will be the heating savings. Yes. And then I wanted to talk a bit about our target groups. Um, this is the overall target group. First up, we have the broad Danish population um, where we want to create awareness about the agenda and help them understand the importance of reducing their use and actually do so. And uh, the ways, the channels that we used for this was outdoor campaigns at bus stations and metro stations and uh, PR and uh, using some of our inside work to do uh, PR um, and print media. And then later on, we're also going to do some TV spots and some films, and of course, also social media. And then we have a targeted effort uh, on our homeowners because energy renovations of your home is a good way to save on heating and electricity bills. And especially if it's done before the heating season, they have more means of action in terms of the energy renovation. So the way that we're uh, uh, doing this with the channels is through social media and offering uh, some webinars in order to increase the knowledge level for the homeowners. Then we also have a targeted effort towards the gas boiler owners as they are in a special situation with the very high prices right now. Um, and the way that we're targeting them is uh, through distributing direct digital information and sending out invites also to webinars, but webinars made uh, especially for, for the gas boiler owners and also through social media. And as the situation is right now, we're also looking to include wood pellet stove owners in our uh, efforts as the price has increased very much. And then we also have a focus on workplaces as they are also in a very hard situation at the moment. And um, we started this in uh, the middle of September by taking the lead in the public buildings with a campaign to uh, keep the temperature at maximum 19 degrees at the public buildings to take the lead. And then we also saw in our insight and research work that uh, Danes are not the best at taking their good uh, energy habits to work. So we would like to raise the awareness on that also. Yes. And then I wanted to talk a bit about our learning so far as the campaign is still running. 
um, our learning so far has mostly con been concentrated on the ability to work with this moving target, as we're calling it. Um, the situation changes all the time, so it requires the ability to read and understand the target groups, and also the flexibility to act upon sudden changes. And we need to adapt to these sudden changes. So we have set up some ways to do so. So I'm going to explain a bit about how we navigate. I think this is a very interesting part. So I think it would be very interesting also to hear from others also during the break, how you navigate in this situation. But one way that we do it is um, about listening to the population and being aware of their situation. So we do this by doing frequent population surveys in order to test um, our uh, messaging and also from report from our national advisory service and hotline. The picture that you can see is actually our national advisory service being out in the Danish summer countryside, handing out some uh, material on how to save energy and talking to the citizens out there. Um, because they host a lot of uh, events for the citizens. So that's a very great way to get feedback and inputs from them in terms of tendencies and what is um, going on in the uh, general situation. Then we also get feedback from our partners. There's, this is especially important when we're talking about the workplaces. Um, we uh, set up cooperations with uh, some of the larger industry organizations in order to cooperate with them. And of course, we also cooperate with other parts of the Danish Energy Agency. Um, for example, with my colleague Nida, who's sitting right next, next to me, but also in terms of our Department for Energy Supply in general uh, to follow the market. And based on all of these inputs, we operate with a scaling of our concept or our tone of voice in terms of adapting to the seriousness of the situation. And then, of course, we also test and evaluate, especially on the drivers for the campaign, as I told you in the beginning, in order to adjust them along the way. But it is, uh, in no doubt, a very hard situation to navigate in. And then uh, for the last part, I just wanted to include a part on how we measure effects because it's as many of you that's also working with this know it can sometimes be hard to do so. Um, so of course we work with the traditional campaign KPIs such as views and leads and downloads and interactions. Um, but then we also do the population service as I was telling you about where uh, we did one in the beginning of the uh, campaign in order to use it for insights and research where we asked on people's um, will to act on specific advice. Um, and then we will also do one asking the same questions at the end of the campaign to see the potential shift. And then now we're also looking for ways to follow the national energy consumption uh, and working with that in terms of effect measurement for the entire campaign. But that is also something that is quite difficult that is, as it can be hard to separate households from the entire industry in terms of the consumption. Yes, so I understand that we will ta be taking the questions afterwards, but I just wanted to show you a bit of the material that we made for this summer. And that was it from me. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And next, we're going to go to our colleague, Tom Halpin, the head of communications with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. He'll talk to us about it, the Reduce Your Use campaign. I hope you can see that's on your screens now. And I'll go to the full screen mode. So I'm speaking this morning on behalf of colleagues at the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications. SEAI has been working closely with the department. They're the lead uh, agency for this campaign. Uh, so when I use the term we, it's on behalf of them. 
Uh, just to give a context as to where we started for phase one of the campaign, phase one ran from uh, late spring. So in identifying the needs, we saw that there was a need for public aware greater public awareness of the linkages between energy efficiency, energy use and cost saving, something that mightn't have been fully clear in people's minds. To inform the public of the wider government support and supports that are available, be they in terms of uh, energy supply and energy cost supports, or uh, home energy upgrade and uh, other forms of grant. And to establish an energy efficiency context, uh, or sorry, establish energy efficiency within the broader uh, energy security context. So there's great similarities throughout this presentation with our colleagues from uh, Denmark. Uh, the challenges we faced where first of all, that there was to be an extremely tight turnaround, uh, as we all know, the rapidly worsening situation in Ukraine. Uh, prompted the dramatic price increases and the grave concerns about energy security. There wasn't a real opportunity to test messaging. And in fact, phase one went live uh, without any testing having proceeded. But I will give you a couple of insights about that in a moment. There was no baseline research on actual energy efficiency behaviours in Ireland. Uh, and that has still to be established. And it was launched in the context of a backlash from the public who uh, really pushed back on advice and tips about how to save energy, but instead were crying out for financial assistance from the government to be able to afford the uh, increasing energy prices. So the communications objectives for phase one of the campaign were to, first of all, kickstart regular government energy efficiency campaigns, establishing a platform that would be usable in the case of energy emergency scenarios such as the more prevalent uh, risk that is arising now. To establish a platform that would not attract a public backlash, that's kind of a counterintuitive, but something that wouldn't be received negatively was important. And then to highlight the government supports that are available for homes and businesses to tackle the uh, rising cost of living crisis. Uh, at the start, the Department of the Environment, on whose behalf I'm speaking, established a national working group and it comprised all the major players in energy in Ireland. So uh, two other government departments, Enterprise, which represents all the major business interests, and the Department of Transport, the energy regulator, of which we have one, uh, the uh, electricity uh, TSO and DSO, the gas TSO, the National Oil Reserves, and ourselves in the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Phase one of the campaign, which ran in late spring, uh, was a four week burst. It was across uh, national and regional radio. It was uh, in the national press. Social media was always on. The radio ads were also streamed across major uh, audio streaming platforms. Public relations was led both by the department, uh, but also uh, working, the working group members led out on relevant uh, public relations engagement on their uh, particular projects and programs. And on digital, we operated homepage takeovers on key news and uh, consumer sites. The ad to the right is a demonstration of, or an example of the uh, messaging and to Dr. Mudaway's comments earlier on, this is the, the narrative we were, uh, and, and the, sorry, the context we were setting was of course the Ukraine war. Uh, though it wasn't called out specifically, it was referred to as war and conflict. Uh, and the, uh, con the message was that people had an opportunity to work with government to reduce their use. Uh, and uh, we focus on four key areas. So as to simplify it, we moved away from the small little granular tips like appliances on standby or unplugging phone chargers because we felt there was a need to accelerate action but at the same time keep it relatively simple and straightforward so the focus was on heating which the heating season was still in in play when the campaign was launched and that was time temperature and zone control uh, appliances smart use of appliances and also avoiding the peak electricity period. And that has become a more significant matter now, given that we have some challenges on electricity supply availability relative to anticipated demand for this coming winter season. Travel, the first message was to avoid using your car wherever possible, and instead to consider walking, uh, cycling or public transport. And the last message was, if you must drive, well then drive at a more modest speed 
to save energy. Across the board, there were significant outputs from the campaign, uh, several millions of uh, impressions across social media. Ad was seen many times, very strong listen through rates on the digital audio. Uh, owned assets being the uh, government reduce your use website uh, had 17,000 sessions uh, in, in the first uh, six to eight weeks. And total societal reach, or sorry, total social reach was 2.7 million impressions. And that's the organic rather than paid. And then on earned media, which is the public relations, total media reach was 3.4 million listeners or readers. And that was complemented substantially by below the line support from collaborating agencies. So for example, SEAI ourselves, we ran public relations campaigns uh, on heating, on boiler servicing and on uh, driving at appropriate junctures during the uh, spring and summer. Phase two, reflects on what was achieved, reflecting on what was achieved in phase one. Phase two, uh, which will kick off uh, during the middle of next month, October, uh, reflecting on what was done, what was learned. We've established new objectives or refined objectives rather. First is to clearly demonstrate that the government understands the cost of living challenges that people are uh, encountering to direct all people firstly to the uh, all available financial supports to advise people on how best they can reduce their energy use then to stretch that and to encourage them towards long-term sustainable behavior as part of a new normal because when we hopefully at some stage exit this particular crisis we'd like to see a more resilient uh, long-term behavioral change that favors uh, environmentally sustainable energy use and then to profile government actions within their own energy use. So in other words, uh, draw attention to the fact that the government has taken actions with respect to its own estate of buildings with true uh, energy efficiency measures, including lighting and heating and more uh, stringent requirements that have been imposed this autumn. Two key messages for people are to reduce their costs by availing of the supports that are available and to reduce their use through no and low cost behaviours, though with actions uh, primarily led by SEAI, we're also uh, allowing people to go one step further, whereby if they've taken on board all the cost supports, taken on board all the usage changes, they can also then avail of grants and there are substantial grants available. And just yesterday, uh, our, the uh, Government of Ireland announced its budget, which included several measures that relate to uh, addressing the supports that are available, both for supporting immediate costs, but also the scale of continued grants available for uh, homes in Ireland. Uh, and to put that in context, the, the target is for 37,000 homes to be upgraded uh, through next year, which is a 50% increase on this year's target. The campaign, as I said, will kick off, phase two of the campaign will kick off uh, during the middle of next, or through next month and it will be multi-channel across TV, print, radio, cinema, outdoor and digital, which will be display, social and PPC. The, it will run from October through to March and it will run at a, generally at a, an intensity level that is around four times what phase one was now that we've established uh, the ground rules as it were. Uh, as with our Danish colleague, uh, measurement is key. So in the short term, there has been some message testing. Our own behavioral economics team did an assessment of the framing of the message, albeit that this was being done while phase one was running. Uh, interestingly enough, we didn't find in that a, particular, uh, a particularly strong leaning towards either the environmental, the security, or the cost uh, messaging. Uh, but we will be to, the, the uh, agencies will be testing that again uh, to to establish the the messaging for the forthcoming phase. In the medium term, uh, the department are initiating twice monthly tracking of sentiment to energy costs to the energy and cost of living crisis. In the long term, 
Uh, again, our colleagues in the behavioral economics team in SEAI is working with the department to establish a bi-monthly longitudinal assessment of behavioral intent and change, uh, which is a more should be a more robust and more informative uh, than simply tracking sentiment. Uh, this, there is, this is seen to have uh, potential scope for longer term sustainability measurement. So in other words, once this uh, framework is established, it might be used to establish people's uh, behavioral intent relative to matters like waste, water, travel, etc. And uh, uh, through the working group, uh, we are exploring whether it's possible to measure actual usage change through energy utilities and our smart meters, uh, though that presents obvious challenges. Uh, so that's a whistle stop tour of the Reduce Your Use campaign as run in Ireland. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to move quickly because we are starting to run a little bit short on time to Mr. Lucas Bollet from the Netherlands about their Flip the Switch campaign. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll try, try to keep it short to leave enough room for my Italian colleagues and colleagues from the, from the IEA itself. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the colleagues who've presented so far for your uh, excellent presentations. You've set the bar quite high. Um, but today I will talk a bit about the Dutch information campaign uh, called Zet ook de knop om. Uh, which loosely translates to flip the switch in English. Um, and the campaign started in spring this year uh, as a direct response to the rising energy prices, mostly gas prices at that time, um, and, and rising energy bills. Um, and I think the goal was mainly to raise awareness and to help people understand what can I do now to take actions and to lower my energy bill now. And that's also why the campaign was focused on short-term actions that people could implement uh, tomorrow, basically. Um, and it was a broad campaign mainly aimed at households, uh, but also at, at companies. But as we will see, um, maybe the focus could have been a bit more on companies, uh, which is now something we're taking for the, for the next phase. Um, on the picture here, you see the kickoff, uh, which is on the left, uh, my minister, the Minister for uh, Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, Rob Jetten, and on the right, the Minister for the Interior Affairs, uh, who both... Uh, kicked off the campaign with a press conference, but we thought uh, next to a press conference, show what you do. Um, so they also literally flipped the switch in one of the government buildings um, to see uh, that it actually worked and that uh, the governments give an example. Um, so the main actions we um, communicated to the broad public and to companies are pretty similar to what I've heard from, from Danish, Irish, and uh, Japanese and Korean colleagues so far. Um, households, it focused on heating, um, turning down your thermostat to 19 degrees when you're there and when you're sleeping or when you're not there, turn it to 15 degrees. Um, and also make sure that in rooms you don't use, uh, you turn the heater uh, down as well. Um, and secondly, tips about um, shower five minutes if you take hot showers, um, because then you can save some, uh, some money as well. For companies, um, of course, showering is not a measure you, you recommend. Um, so I focused on heating, similar measures for households uh, on lighting, uh, both turning lights off, but also installing LED lighting. And lastly, ventilation, uh, turn that down outside office times. And some extra tips uh, if people want to take more actions. Um, well, this, this uh, scheme gives a broad overview of all the different uh, instruments we used to distribute the message. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that uh, in the second row, you see a Dutch word called mating, uh, which means measurement. Uh, and that shows that at the beginning of the campaign and at the end of the campaign, um, we did a survey to measure uh, the results um, in people's attitudes uh, towards these uh, campaign measures and whether the campaign actually had some, some effect. Uh, and I'll come back to that, uh, the results later. Um, well, to quickly, where did we uh, distribute the message? Well, in newspapers, uh, big ads for both households and companies. Uh, in national and regional newspapers, um, also TV and radio. Um, the minister himself gave interviews uh, and, and mentioned the campaign in different talk shows to keep awareness for the campaign up. Um, but secondly, also TV commercials. Uh, you see one there on the, on the bottom right, which focused on one of the measures and then linked through to the website where people could more uh, find more information. Uh, and also some radio commercials with uh, similar messages. Um, and lastly, of course, social media, uh, the usual suspects, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, with some targeted information, but not very detailed targeted information since it was aimed at the, at the broad public, with again, easily click through to the, to the website to find more information. Um, 
But then uh, the main question is, of course, the results. Um, well, like colleagues have mentioned, there are some results in terms of impressions, clicks, likes, time spent on the website, visitors for the website, uh, where we can get some information for. Um, but we would like to quantify the effects in terms of what did you realize in energy efficiency? Um, and uh, well, this is of course a horrible graph because the uh, line is in yellow, but you can see the unique visitors on the website, uh, which shows um, over time when the campaign was uh, running high, more people visited the website. When the campaign was running low, less people visited the website. Uh, but we would like to quantify the effects, as I mentioned, in terms of energy efficiency, which is why we did the survey. Um, the survey is currently still being analyzed with lots of data by people a lot smarter than me, um, but I brought three main questions that we asked in terms of attitudes. Uh, the first one is, do people know what they can do for gas savings? Uh, and here we asked people, what can you do to save gas? Uh, and we noticed a difference in the effects of the measures we communicated. Uh, the top measure you can see here is uh, turn down your thermostat. And you can see that more people said thermostat turning down is a measure that helps to save gas. Um, so that's already uh, some indication of raised awareness. Um, of course, we are still analyzing how robust all these results are, uh, which will follow in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Secondly, the question, did people actually take more measures? So then uh, it's, uh, of course, self-stated. So um, in a survey, people can say what they want, but assuming they all say what's true, we see that more people actually took the measures that we recommended. Um, Again, the top one is turn down the thermostat um, to, to 19 degrees. So we see more people actually taking that measure. Uh, the same for uh, reducing the heat in rooms you don't use. Uh, we don't see a significant effect for showering shorter. So apparently Dutch people love their hot showers. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, um, we asked about insights for motivation. Why did you take measures if you took measures? Um, and the, the main driver there remains, which is uh, logical, I think, uh, costs just the high energy bills and you want to save on the high energy bills, um, but also um, some motivation for the climate in general and reducing a dependency on, on Russian gas. Uh, and especially the, the, the climate motivation is, is something that we saw an increase of after the campaign. So apparently that's a message that resonated uh, the most in the campaign of, uh, so far. Um, so some lessons learned. Oh, I can see the four jumped a bit. Um, but uh, some lessons learned for the phase uh, for the campaign going forward, because this campaign started in spring, continued in summer, and we will intensify it in the autumn, which we are now preparing. Uh, and some lessons that we are taking um, is first of all, give a good example as the government yourself. Um, it's of course uh, not very helpful um, as an example that uh, the campaign started, but. My ministry itself still had the lights on at night uh, and the heater uh, on during the day. Uh, and then the message doesn't work because of course you need to first set yourself a good example. And then you can ask consumers and companies to join. Uh, so that's something that we are trying to distribute more in the, in the campaign going forward. Secondly, um, we got a lot of feedback from people. Well, a lot of, we got some feedback from people saying, I'm already taking these measures. Why are you telling me this now? I've already been doing this for months quite late that you're coming with this information. However, we also got the message, better late than never. Um, so even if we're a bit late, it's still good to communicate the message because there are some people who didn't have the message yet who are now hopefully a bit, bit more informed. Uh, thirdly, partners are important. Uh, so that's why moving forward, we're working closely together with industry associations, uh, companies themselves, um, environmental organizations, um, universities, schools to distribute this message to their members and to make sure that the message is spread through different sources uh, and also to target more specifically with, because for one industry association, the measures might be different than for others. And this is of course aimed at broad public. So the industry association can give more tailored information, which is why we're hoping to, uh, to work with them the coming, uh, coming months. Um, fourthly, money can be a motivator. Um, I think that's something that we knew beforehand, but that we could take more into account in distributing the message, which is now for, uh, why for all measures, we try to give an indication of the monetary amount that you save if you implement this measure. measure. Uh, for example, for turning down the thermostat, that's I think 200 euros a year per degree that you turn it down, uh, which is something then, then that captures the attention, hopefully, hopefully a bit more. And lastly, um, companies need to do their part, just like, uh, like government does. So that's why the campaign is also focused more uh, on, on companies in, in autumn and uh, providing more structural measures rather than quick actions, 
because people now also want perspective for the mid to longer term and have taken the quick short term measures ready, but are now curious, what can I do more in the medium to long term? And that, that goes especially for, for companies as well. So those are some of the quick lessons learned, and I think I'll leave it there at that time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go online to Dr. Anna Amato from Italy. Um, Anna will speak to us about the Class A campaign. Good morning. Just a moment. Okay. My name is Anna Mato and I work in uh, Energy Efficiency Agency in uh, a working group coordinating this uh, national training and promotion program on energy efficiency. Uh, Italian Class A is a national long-term campaign and uh, the framework of this program is uh, the implementation of the um, European Energy Efficiency Directive. So now this, this program uh, has become uh, uh, structural and it can be considered as a policy. It's a national, uh, um, it's a, a program based on different types of uh, tools, uh, information on social integration, education, and uh, targeted to large companies, SMEs, public administration, uh, citizen, with the, uh, including the uh, energy for households, school students. And uh, in um, for this different target uh, audience, uh, uh, different actions and tools uh, has been used. And the, the program has been based on uh, three pillars, technologies, uh, the, the economic resources to invest for the renovation and the governance uh, has meant um, um, like uh, rules, uh, pro process, uh, procedures. And uh, the first uh, edition of the Italian Class A campaign uh, uh, included the three phases, so the, first, the first stage for a, a general public audience through uh, TV and uh, radio uh, shows and um, to create uh, an awareness and basic knowledge. The second phase and the second year, in the, 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 there has been the targetization, the tailoring of the message. And uh, the third uh, phase uh, was dedicated to monitoring. Um, the, the program included a lot of uh, actions and initiatives, uh, some uh, exhibitions, uh, uh, the developing of, of uh, info reality web series with researchers, uh, and we used the, the opinion leaders uh, to multiply the effect and the messages. Uh, as a space for women and uh, now we are planning another um, program based on uh, the results of this uh, first edition uh, the successful successful uh, key uh, results uh, i think there, there, there is the target segmentation uh, with the appropriate uh, channel uh, language style the continuous dialogue with stakeholders uh, because we need the inputs of the stakeholders. And uh, the most difficult uh, uh, action uh, probably is uh, how to measure this uh, effect uh, of, the, the, of uh, each uh, uh, action. And um, we try to plan uh, in um, in the design phase, uh, how to monitor the results, how uh, we can use uh, randomized control trials, uh, the effectiveness and the persistence. Now, uh, a new uh, program uh, is going to be launched. Tomorrow, there's a an official uh, launch in, in Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time, the timeline uh, is longer. Uh, in the, the program uh, um, will last until uh, 2030, and uh, this is included in the National Recovery Plan for uh, the renovation wave. Um, this uh, campaign uh, is uh, carried out by ENEA on behalf of the, of the ministry, 
and uh, uh, it's uh, included in uh, in the national decree 2010 20 for uh, the implementation of energy that energy efficiency directive some of initiatives uh, uh, we try to give uh, other keywords um, for example there's a um, design project focused on uh, the link uh, uh, of environmental social impact and buildings and technologies in the energy transition and the focus in la is in line with the new European Bauhaus to enhance inclusion, sustainability, beauty, using uh, bottom-up tools, uh, for example, tactical urbanism, trying to map and share uh, best practices. And uh, another uh, initiative is dedicated to the gender gap, trying to different uh, narrative of STEM, a new lexicon and uh, all of these uh, actions and uh, projects uh, um, will be um, included in uh, a new portal uh, of Italian Class A um, according to interoperability standards and artificial intelligence uh, in a way that uh, users can find all the existing Italian resources on energy efficiency, uh, such as the funding programs, uh, incentive tips, other messages, uh, other key messages uh, used in, uh, in uh, our programs are art, are uh, comfort and air quality, um, conventional tips for energy saving at home, at workplace, uh, program for uh, teachers and school students. Uh, until 14 years, uh, using and uh, um, providing uh, methods, uh, a portal dedicated, uh, and uh, documents. And um, if you want to have, a, I would be, <laughs> I'd like to be short, but if you would you like to have some uh, information, uh, some further information, we can give you uh, other uh, details. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to all the speakers for these very interesting presentations. I'm going to pass it over now to Christina. Um, Christina is the program manager at the Energy Efficiency Hub, and she'll talk to us a little bit about her, her thoughts on uh, on the presentations and on this type of work. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and uh, um, thank you for the slides as well. Um, so as noted earlier, today's really, we're talking about one of the uh, super timely topics, and we've heard from colleagues uh, from all over the world about various campaigns. Um, at the moment, um, the energy prices are certainly rising in 2022. It was marked by record increases. And also we're seeing global inflation this year rose to levels not seen in uh, several decades. And this impact is felt by citizens and businesses. Um, while price rises may be unevenly spread across fuels and regions, um, it's really felt economy-wide. Um, and I should mention that the IEA Energy Efficiency Market Report, which will be released in December, will uh, take up this issue um, among other critical issues as well. Um, consumers are starting to notice the real impact of energy crisis through their energy bills. The graph on the right, for instance, uh, comes from the UK, but it really demonstrates how the impact of everyday activities, everyday appliance use on energy bills is uh, um, quite rising. This is, and it really shows that heating is a huge concern, especially gas heating and also tumble drying as well. So, and we're seeing governments committing to support consumers with both short-term and long-term measures. And a number of colleagues refer to more structural measures um, for the long-term and also immediate measures, such as turning down thermostats, sh shortening sh the shower time sometimes, and also including uh, driving less, 
and um, line drying clothes. And these are all behavioral change measures that um, over the last this year we've seen um, in a number of multiple campaigns that have been launched in response to the current crisis. We've heard today from the Netherlands, we've heard from um, others as well. And here are some of the images from these campaigns. Um, we see Ireland's image at the top as well. So it's quite interesting to see the mixture of visuals used. Um, and of course, uh, the IA also collaborated with the European Commission on Playing My Part um, campaign earlier this year, too. Um, we began seeing these uh, catchy websites and names um, um, asking people to make real changes in their daily lives um, late this spring. Um, the campaigns differ in their style and how detailed the messages are, uh, while some are quite specific in terms of uh, temperatures um, and in terms of uh, minutes of shower in some cases, uh, while others ask for more general conservation of energy. So here I wanted to um, spend some time and talk about a number of emerging best practices that we're seeing in campaign design. Um, governments historically have had experience running public service announcements and behavioral campaigns share some of these features. Um, but they go further in asking people to act and sometimes act now. Campaigns are likely to succeed, are more likely to succeed if the messages are targeted, relatable, actionable, and also hit the right tone. So here the decision can really be taken to highlight the benefits, whether they involve monetary savings, environmental conservation, or social aspects. Um, presentations earlier, uh, notably by Denmark, has shown that a stronger focus was on the economy and security, and they highlighted the very clear targeting as well. Um, Ireland and Netherlands also emphasized the importance of message testing. Um, the German campaign, for instance, um, it was really trying to appeal to the cross-social call to action in a way to really save energy. And to echo Ireland's remarks as well, it's important to strike the right tone so that citizens don't feel that they're being asked to solve a problem that they see as being someone else's responsibility. Um, so next, let's talk about getting the message across. Um, so here, when it comes to getting the message across, finding good partners and good channels to ampli amplify the message can really contribute to the campaign success as well. And uh, we've, today, we've also heard from the Netherlands actively involving industry, NGOs, foundations, and the media in its campaign. Making industry an ally early on can also be quite helpful in terms of leveraging the private sector resources um, and their experience with advertising advertising and media. Um, we've seen the uh, creative use of visuals as well, and it increases shareability, especially videos. Um, I should mention that having a dedicated website is easier for citizens to find it and share it and allows for easier impact tracking. And impact tracking, specifically seeing the website traffic, um, doing surveys as shown by Denmark can be quite helpful in uh, um, changing potentially in the future campaign or uh, perhaps uh, changing the messaging after seeing who's going to the website, how the traffic changes even throughout the day. We've also heard about using multiple channels, um, such as uh, television, radio, and social media. Um, just as a reflection from previous uh, presentations, Korea demonstrated an effective use of social media, including the messaging platform Kakao, and uh, in addition to TV, radio, and other activities. Ireland showed the use of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and notably the use of paid social media, which is also quite interesting. Um, certainly Brazil's conscious consumption campaign also demonstrated the use of energy influencers. Um, that's another part of the multi-channel um, outreach um, that the campaigns could do. Um, and it should be mentioned that uh, Japan used SMS and email and telephone to also reach um, consumers. Um, Combining information with behavioral insights um, is also quite important. And uh, here, um, we can take a look at uh, real-time feedback, relevant nudges, demand response programs, and more. Um, also using insights from behavioral specialists can greatly enhance the success of the campaign. So this was also earlier demonstrated by Ireland as well. 
Um, and uh, the second part of the workshop will also feature several behavioral specialists um, here in the room as well as online. Um, now let's turn to campaigns and crisis and how does that change the nature of campaign? Um, energy has been in the news quite a bit and consumers have uh, quite a strong awareness of the energy issues right now. Um, as shown by Denmark, the message was really um, that together we can reduce energy, which plays towards the social aspect and towards the solidarity of citizens. Um, it focuses on in times of crisis that the governments can have a stronger message that uh, uh, can be justified due to the urgency. And to echo earlier remarks from Japan, the emergency campaign that was launched after the earthquake also encouraged businesses, utilities, and citizens to drastically cut their energy and households accounted for half of all savings. So that's also a, quite an interesting finding. Brazil and South Africa have had experience uh, with emergency campaigns as well. So there's uh, quite a bit of past experience as well as current experience that could be drawn on for new campaigns. So I'll briefly go to the point from the previous slide that digital technologies and behavioral insights can help accelerate energy efficiency measures and practices. So here, one could look at real-time feedback um, by smart meters and smart thermostats that can further reduce gas consumption by up to 5%. Some studies have found that programmable thermostats can reduce heating energy demand by up to 15% as well. Um, I should mention competitions and games that have uh, quite a significant impact, as well as regular feedback through home energy reports that we'll hear more about uh, from OPower in the second part of, the, um, of this workshop. Goal setting and prompts are important, as well as a change of default settings. Overall, behavior change is a very timely topic, and we'll continue looking at energy saving campaigns and sharing emerging insights. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass the floor back to the chair. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. So given time, we're going to skip the Q&A for today. We'll take a 15-minute break and come back um, for the second part of our discussion. So um, we'll be back on in 15 minutes. Thank you.
right, thank you. Welcome back for the second session of the special workshop on behavior change and awareness campaigns for energy demand reduction. I'm David Shipworth. I'm the chair of the User-Centered Energy Systems Technology Collaboration Program by the IEA. I'm also a professor at the Energy Institute at University College London and spent a lot of my time looking at the role of people within the energy system. We have a very interesting lineup of speakers for this second session. Coming from a wide range of backgrounds, I will introduce them shortly, but first I'll just explain how this session will run. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll build on the insights that came from the first session. And I'll just reflect briefly on some kind of you know, observations from that first session to set a bit of the context. Firstly, context matters. So clearly setting the tone, content, and channels of messaging for these campaigns is something that must be developed in a local context with local knowledge. Secondly, the fundamentals matter. And this is both in terms of the underlying physical forms of energy we're trying to impact on, but also there are fundamental behavioral change mechanisms being activated across these wide range of programs. And thirdly, it's clear that evaluation matters. And that came through strongly from the first session. So how we report and understand the savings is really important to understanding the impact. So in this session, we will ask how policymakers can best design and implement the campaigns, as well as wider behavioral change programs to reduce demand both in the immediate term in response to the crisis and the longer term. Each of our speakers will give some introductory marks for about seven to 10 minutes. And after that, we will have any quick questions purely of clarification before moving on to the next question. If you have more substantive questions, if we can save those up to the moderated discussion. We will then, after the presentations, move into Q&A from those in the room, as well as those on Zoom. And I'd just like to reiterate that all of the presentations that were in the first session, including that from our colleague in Korea, will be circulated to the participants in the End Use Working Party. So at this stage, I'd like to move to our first speaker, um, Jasper Eikson, who is a Managing Director of The Behaviorist. He is joining us online. The Behaviorist is a consultancy that applies insights from behavioral science, economics, and data analysis to help solve organizational challenges. Jasper is also a task leader for one of the users TCP tasks on behavioral insights. So Jasper, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, for having me. I'm just gonna try to share my screen now really quick. Um, hopefully. You could see that all right. Right, okay. So uh, I'm here in my capacity as one of the operating agents of the Users TCP Behavioral Insights Platform. And I am here to speak about a new toolkit that we have developed. So uh, this toolkit is called the Behavioral Insights Toolkit. The goal of this toolkit is to help policymakers improve the efficacy of demand side energy policies. It's been developed over the past year by the users TCP, but also in collaboration with over 20 behavioral science experts from six different participating countries. This toolkit is uh, freely available online at the link that is shown on the slide here. So bitoolkit.userstcp.org, and I'll show that link again a bit later on. Right, so you might ask what this toolkit does more, more, more specifically. So first of all, this toolkit helps policymakers identify important behavioral factors that might influence the success of their policies. And moreover, uh, once those factors have been identified, we also provide some recommendations and guidance with regards to how to address them. And this is something that's very important because over the past few years, we've seen several examples of you know, well-intentioned and maybe even big budget energy policies that have failed to perhaps live up to their expectations because different behavioral factors have not been taken into account adequately, such as social norms, you know, people's tendency to procrastinate and the whole host of things like this. Um, it should also be said, however, that the, the tool does not directly tell the user that you know, policy A is better than policy B, 
but rather gets it's supposed to get the user to sort of reflect upon different factors that might impact the success of their policy. So rather than talk about the toolkit, I'm now going to do a quick walkthrough of the toolkit with, with an example, uh, just to show you how it works. Right, so again, the link here is the BI toolkit, userccp.org. And so this is the landing page for the toolkit. Um, here you have a few different options as a user. Uh, first of all, you can select whether you're developing a new policy or program, and then you click this main option here. Or you can have perhaps a, a policy that you've already implemented that you're interested in improving in some way, and then you can click this option here. Um, up here in the top menu, we have some information about the toolkit and how it was developed. We're also soon going to be posting some online courses with videos that explain how uh, behavioral insights can be applied to energy policy. Um, and now I'm going to just go through an example of, for, of how we might use this toolkit. So say, for example, we want to design a campaign similar to those that have been discussed during the previous section, focused on generating sort of immediate productions in, in uh, demand um, following, let's say, an information campaign. So what I would then do is if I want to design this type of policy, I would click, I'm developing a new program. You'd start here. The toolkit is now going to ask us a few different uh, questions to sort of try to tailor some of the recommendations that it later outputs. So first we choose the area of focus. So let's say for this campaign, we're interested in uh, reducing uh, consumption among residents. But, uh, there are other options, of course, here, you could say that you're interested in sort of targeting transportation or businesses, but we're gonna click buildings uh, because we're interested in residents here for this example. So uh, we now move on to the outcome of the program. So are we interested in directly changing uh, users' habits and their energy consumption? Or do we sort of want to do that through indirect means by uh, asking them to take up or adopt some new type of technology? So you could click that you were looking to do both of these things or that you just perhaps want to do one of the two. And right now for this example, we're just going to uh, look at uh, directly changing people's uh, energy consumption patterns rather than both. So moving forward and clicking next here, uh, now we move on to the, the next part of this customization, which looks at the type of policy lever or instrument that you're looking to, to use. So here, for example, you can enforce or ban behaviors. This could be through regulations and things like this. Um, another option is to incentivize or disincentivize behaviors, for example, through you know, social incentives. It could also be through monetary incentives and things like that, or subsidies. Um, another option, that we provide here is that um, you want to provide like a type of service or an infrastructure or something like this as a policy that helps the, the, the citizens reduce their energy consumption. And finally here, the, the final example is that the, you want to provide some information and indeed this is what we want to do, do now with this example we're walking through. So we're going to click this here, but again, you can click multiple different options here if you want to have a more complex policy that does several things at once. Right, now we're finished with, with the sort of the, the, the tailoring. And so what we have now is we've reached this kind of like final screen where the toolkit displays different behavioral factors that are important in determining the success of, of the policy that you're designing. And so here for this example, the, the uh, factors that the toolkit highlights is a lack of attractiveness of the information you're presenting that citizens might have limited capabilities when it comes to acting upon the information, that there might be sort of a, a negative social environment surrounding adopting this behavior, um, that people simply aren't aware of what you're trying to accomplish because they aren't necessarily seeing or engaging with the, with the information, um, that there are sort of like negative pre-existing attitudes toward, toward this thing you're asking them to do, or that it's sort of difficult for citizens to commit to actually going through with, with the thing that you're recommending and trying to achieve. So here with the toolkit, as I mentioned before, the goal is really to sort of make policymakers reflect upon and think about these different uh, factors and whether they're present in, in the context that they're operating in. Um, and you know that might mean that they have to conduct some additional research to understand whether any of these issues are present. Um, and if indeed they, they realize that some of these issues are present, you know, they might say that, okay, maybe this policy option and this policy tool isn't ideal, I should go back and try something else. Or it could be that, okay, now I should think about ways of addressing these factors to make sure that the policy is a success. So what we have here um, underneath 
each of these behavioral factors is a link to another page that pre presents sort of some different examples for, for example, how to improve awareness. So if we click this link here, it's gonna open a new page. And here we have a checklist for how to make sure that citizens are actually aware of, of, of the, the, the sort of message that you're trying to convey through your information campaign. So here we have a few recommendations. Uh, for each recommendation, you can expand these and it has some information on like what you should be doing and also associated with uh, a case study of an example where this has been done before. So here it's about appropriate, uh, identifying appropriate communication channels. Um, here another example is that um, you should identify and leverage the right messengers for the type of campaign that you're trying to do. And this is something, of course, that was discussed during the previous session. Um, using timely prompts to make sure that people actually you know, see the information at a time at which they can change their behavior and so forth. So we have a lot of different ones here. And um, the more complex the policy you pick, the more different types of recommendations there will, there will be. So if, if you're not interested in sort of going through this whole tailoring exercise and you just actually want to know some, something about like general behavioral insights, we've also got this checklist here that you can access through the top which basically just provides different uh, examples of, of uh, these behavioral factors that are important and where you can sort of learn more about them and, and how to make sure that these, these behavioral factors are, are addressed adequately. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jesper. Um, I'm just going to look briefly around the room to see if there's any immediate questions of clarification for Jesper. Okay, I'm not seeing any immediately. So we'll roll questions up and take them at the end if they're more substantive. So next, I will go to Peter Conradi. Um, he's a senior researcher at IMAC at the University of Ghent. His research interests include understanding and facilitating sustainable behavior and attitudes through application of theoretical frameworks from social psychology with an emphasis on quantitative methods. During the discussion, he will be joined by his colleague Philippos Agnostopoulos, and a who's a senior researcher at IWPC. So, Peter, I'll hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. So, I'll be presenting some results from the Nudge project, where we looked at how we can motivate the reduction of eating consumption. Um, in Europe. So the Nudge project consists of a healthy mix of research institutes, uh, developers, but also pilot sites. I won't go through all of them in, in detail. Um, the bulk of what I want to talk to you about today has been a survey that we performed uh, uh, among around 3,000 uh, people in Europe. Um, a large part of the survey, survey consisted of uh, Dutch-speaking Flemish participants, but we also have quite a big cohort of, of other um, participants from, from all over Europe. So the survey structure, um, go through it briefly. First, we wanted to know some general characteristics of the, the dwelling. So how do people live? Um, do they have, uh, do they own some uh, sources of uh, renewable energy? For example, PV installations. Um, we also wanted to know, do people already have some energy saving behaviors across a variety of domains? The third module is the, the bulk of the, of the work is a behavioral model that we tested where we looked at some of the attitudes, motivations, and behavioral constructs that uh, try to predict the intent to reduce heating consumption. Finally, we, or the fourth one, we looked at potential energy platforms that provide real-time energy monitoring and how people feel about these. And finally, we have some socio-demographic information, uh, age, gender, et cetera. To, treat, to try and see if these have an impact on intent. So first, some of the results from saving behavior, heating and cooling. So as everyone probably uh, uh, know quite well, heating is the biggest uh, use of energy within Europe, even in countries in the Mediterranean. It consists of the bulk of, of energy usage. So that's why we also focused on uh, heating and also cooling. And here you can see, uh, quite interesting, these results were done before the energy crisis. But even in some of the behaviors that are quite often, we still see a group of maybe 10, 20 to sometimes 30% of people who uh, rarely or never perform certain very common behaviors such as turning off the heating, 
when they are not in the room. So this clearly shows that there's still some space for uh, energy efficiency improvements in people's behavior. Uh, then our behavioral model, we uh, developed it. It's novel in a sense that we are combining different pathways to decision making. So first we have the rational or deliberate process of this decision making. This is combined with the moral reactive path. So thinking about how do I personally morally feel about climate change, about reducing my energy consumption, and then the social reactive path. So um, what does people around me think? Uh, and what do I think of other people who are reducing their energy consumption? So we uh, find a positive association of all these three paths on the intent to reduce consumption, but the effects are different. So some of them are stronger and weaker, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So one of the things that we wanted to also understand was what is your attitude towards reducing consumption? Because attitude towards something also is a strong predictor of whether you will engage in that behavior. But of course, saying that is not very interesting. We all know this to be the case. But if you can predict the attitude, then you can also leverage uh, people's behavior. So first one is uh, bill consciousness. So this is obvious that people seem to be motivated by, by money to reduce their uh, consumption but also being aware of energy saving measures and environmental concerns. So these four constructs or these four, four things have a, are, are predictive of your attitude. And then a, a, a fifth one that's very important to consider is the fear of losing comfort. And I think if we looked at the slides before where we showed the different saving behaviors, these all relate a little bit to I'm, I'm afraid of losing the comforts that I have. And as a colleague from the Netherlands uh, spoke about earlier, like showering uh, less, so doing a five-minute shower is is uh, showering less is a lose of loss of comfort. So this presents a barrier towards this kind of behavior change that we want to want to have. Then, when we look at the intent to reduce consumption, this is very significantly impacted by subjective norms. So, what do other people uh, do? Other people approve or disapprove of this type of behavior? So, if other people know that I reduce my consumption, do they approve? And then we also have a very strong effect for perceived behavioral control. So what perceived behavioral control is, is actually the degree to which a person believes that he or she can perform a given behavior. So it's about the belief that I am actually capable of reducing my consumption. And talking about the uh, social reactive path, so positive images of other people reducing their consumption seems also to impact your intent to reduce your own consumption. Um, but also it predicts whether you have done so in the past. Quite interesting. Um, we find an effect, but it's not as strong as we would have thought. Um, a stronger effect we also found for personal moral norms. So do I feel personally responsible for uh, the changing uh, of the climate uh, change, or do I feel personally responsible for reducing my consumption? So personal moral norms, also an important predictor of intent. So then when we... Uh, translate these results to some policy uh, recommendations. Uh, the first thing we would, li would like to present is we need to provide more access uh, to, to, to people about their own consumption. Uh, perceived behavioral control is very important, but it's often not very clear to people what their actual behavior, how that impacts uh, their, their bills, for example. So providing people with much more detailed information about their consumption uh, smart meter rollout is uh, still not as advanced as it can be, uh, and also be able to share the data. Uh, so having developers make uh, applications that can access data about your own consumption is very important. So we have some mock-ups of what this could look like from a from a, uh, a consumer perspective. So for example, here we see uh, in-depth visualization of uh, of your real-time consumption in different rooms, for example but also the social uh, comparison. How do I perform compared to other people that are similar to me? Because the social comparison uh, and social norms are an important aspect for reduction of, of consumption. And the second part is looking more at the, the uh, energy efficiency obligation schemes and how it could be strengthened in their implementation and monitoring, uh, but also push messages, for example, from your uh, retail companies and public other public actors. So having a much more closer connection with the consumer and alerting them at the appropriate time of redu reducing their consumption. So you might think of telling people, okay, the temperature is rising. Why don't you 
turn down your heating or we are expecting uh, a different type of uh, weather tomorrow so anticipate on it um, but also giving direct feedback on your behavior so you see below we have 22,2 uh, um, degrees celsius visualized in red indicating it's it's uh, it's too warm and when you turn it down to 19 the color changes to green giving a very direct feedback to people okay this is something that that is uh, that is good behavior second part of this recommendation is also uh, um, doing some automation of of energy saving procedures i talked a little bit about loss of comfort but it's possible to to do some automation in which people sort of they they externalize their their settings to something else so they still have the same comfort level that's optimized for their type of, of living, but without thinking too much about it. So again, receive behavioral control. I'm, I'm able to perform this behavior um, and I can still have that behavior without losing the comfort that I, that I have in my home. And then tailored and in-person recommendations, uh, I think is also very important uh, because uh, uh, media campaigns speak to a broad population. But once you have a more data availability and more data uh, information about particular individual behavior, you can perform and provide much more tailored uh, recommendations. And looking back at the research that we have done, it's possible to say, and, and we've also done some analysis in the project, what type of messaging appeals to particular persons. Some people are motivated by bill consciousness, for example. They care about saving money. Other people have no idea what their energy costs, but they are motivated by uh, protect, protecting the environment so these factors can have an important role to play in providing personalized uh, recommendations and then the third one i think uh, has been spoken about quite a lot and i'm very happy uh, again to see uh, a lot of the, the campaigns that have been done also uh, a colleague from the netherlands who also performed uh, measurements to see how effective they are so we know that there uh, or at least we, we suspect that there might be an effect and we also in our results think that Things like changing your attitude, emphasizing the impact of consumption on the environment have a, a, a role to play in uh, reducing energy consumption. We can add that to add to that things like um, role models. So we see the, the impact of subjective norms, but also having positive role models is important. Um, goal setting. So can I reach a certain goal? Can I reduce my consumption? Can I uh, have five days a week of maybe 19 degrees? in the home uh, these are important things uh, and then financial impact it's still not really clear to consumers how much their energy costs and how much their behavior impacts their final bill so these are all things that we think can have an important role to play um, i would invite you afterwards if you want to have, have more information detailed about the exact study the effect sizes i'm happy to talk to you about that um, if there are any questions then that's it for us people still want to add something Right, thank you, Peter. Um, so, just briefly, are there any questions of clarification around Peter's presentation? Okay, not seeing any. Um, okay, so thank you. We'll move next on to um, a presentation from Simrat Kaur, who's joining us from the Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy in India. Simrat is a senior research associate at AEEE. She is an energy efficiency professional with several years of experience producing data-driven and evidence-based research to support energy efficiency policy making in the area of behavioral energy efficiency. Simrat, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, David. Uh, firstly, I want to thank IEA for organizing this wonderful workshop. We at Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy India recognize the key role of behavioral energy efficiency in, um, in delivering energy savings. And in my presentation today, I will be broadly talking about the powerful role of messaging and narratives in behavior change communications. And more specifically, I'll be focusing on one of AEEE's programs, which is run at 24. Um, okay, thank you. 
sorry for that so i want to start my presentation by talking about one of the very successful behavior change campaigns from india which is the polio immunization campaign and this is not related to energy efficiency or consumption in any way but it still has very important lessons for the design of uh, behavior campaigns so to give you a little bit of context this is from 1990s when india was accountable for more than 60% of polio global polio cases and i just want to focus a little bit about the media and communication strategy of this campaign so uh the first thing is that this campaign had very simple messaging it had the tagline two drops for life it did not delve into any scientific information on what is the risk of polio what is the benefits of vaccine just a simple tagline two drops for life uh and these taglines kept evolving with the changing needs of the program so it evolves to every child every time to highlight the need for repeated doses and then it evolves to my child each time to put the onus on parents to get their child vaccinated the posters were put up in huge numbers before each uh, round of polio vaccine and they were also very strategically placed in those areas where you expect a high movement of people such as bus stops railway stations etc a very popular bollywood star amitabh bachchan was also roped in for this campaign because of his influence on people and he played a key role in building public confidence now this campaign was very successful as you can see on the graph the last polio case in india was recorded in 2011 and in 2014 india received the polio free certification from world health organization now this was just one of the examples of various campaigns that have been launched by the government of india in the last years and i have a, a couple of other examples here such as the clean india initiative the educate girl child initiative save the tiger initiative and so on the point here is that despite the very diverse socio economic construct of india where people come from very different ethnicities languages religions etc it is still very much possible to bring people together for a cause now while these were examples from various social issues very recently the government of india has also uh, uh, focused on a citizen centric approach to combating climate change the honorable prime minister of india um, shri narendra modi announced the lifestyle for environment campaign at cop 26 and introduced the idea of pro planet people now i want to focus a uh, okay i want to focus a little bit about energy saving behavior which i believe can be broadly categorized into four types the first is we are trying to encourage consumers to reduce their energy consumption and an example of that intervention would be home energy reports which encourages households to catch up to their more energy efficient peers the second type is switching for instance encouraging people to switch to electric vehicles the third type could be shifting and an example of that is demand response programs which encourages people to shift their energy consumption due to non peak hours and the fourth type is upgrading and star labeling programs for instance encourage people to invest in more energy efficient appliances now in all of these uh, interventions our first instinct usually is to educate the consumers since energy efficiency is in their best interest however uh, despite best intentions consumers largely fail to take decisions which are in their best interest and there are a couple of behavioral insights which explain why this is the case the first thing is that energy consumption has very low visibility of course we see a tube light turning on and off but we do not see how much energy is being consumed related to this is the aspect that energy consumption is also a very automatic process of all the things that we care about or indulge in a day how much energy is being consumed or how energy efficient it is would rank really low in terms of our cognitive focus and the third point is that our consumption of energy and the cost that's incurred usually occurs at very different time points which makes it difficult to uh, uh, relate our actions with consequences now these behavioral insights have a couple of um uh, implications for the framing of messages what this tells us is that the messages have to be as simple as possible and used consistently it has to appeal to the emotions of people and build resonance with them now a key point here is that uh 
it might not be the case that every time highlighting the monetary or environmental benefits of energy efficiency would work. Instead, sometimes highlighting the well-being, comfort, or convenience benefits of energy efficiency might be more impactful. And the fourth point is that the messaging has to be timed well. So for instance, if you're trying to encourage the purchase of more energy efficient appliances, perhaps it's best to do so during the discount or sale season when a person is more likely to purchase a new appliance. So with these guiding tenets in mind, AEEE has been focusing on very uh, um, a specific behavior, uh, which has given rise to this run, run at 24 campaign. The objective of this campaign is to encourage room air conditioners users in India to run their air conditioners at 24 degrees Celsius or above. This stems from the India model for adaptive thermal comfort, which says that uh, for Indian climatic conditions, a set point of 24 to 25 degrees Celsius is comfortable. The reality, however, is very different. So this is from our survey that we did with 400 AC users in three cities. And we found out that 70% of the respondents actually use their air conditioners from 18 to 23 degrees Celsius. Now, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in India has been taking a couple of steps in this regard to encourage this behavior. The first thing that they did was that they uh, introduced a default setting of 24 degrees Celsius in all new manufactured ACs from 2022. Second, they have also issued guidelines for voluntary adoption for commercial buildings, such as airports, shopping malls, um, uh, hotels, etc., so that they maintain a temperature of 24 to 25 degrees Celsius. And thirdly, they also have been running a digital campaign, AC at 24, and you see an exhibit from one of your social media posts on screen, and you'll notice that they have been mainly highlighting the monetary and environmental benefits of this behavior. So what we did from our survey, we saw that 30% of respondents actually do use their air conditioners at 24 degrees Celsius or above. So we tried to probe further that what were their reasons for doing so. The first thing the respondents said is that a higher set point temperature setting was comfortable for them. They felt neither too hot nor too cold. The second thing was that respondents said that at a higher set point temperature, the chances of catching cough or cold was less. The third reason was that a higher set point temperature setting suited most members of the family. So this is specifically uh, if they had elderly or children living with them. And lastly, uh, with a higher set point temperature setting, you don't have to frequently keep changing the set point. So this exercise actually gave us the key elements of our messaging. So what we are trying to do uh, through this campaign now is we are trying to test out uh, new messaging, which has these four elements, comfort, health, empathy, and convenience. And we're trying to assess uh, through, uh, we're trying to create animated videos, just we're recording podcasts on this to see if perhaps this messaging can be more impactful in steering consumer behavior. Now, messaging is one part of the picture. The other thing that we are uh, now trying to look at is whether dynamic display of power consumption in air conditioners can be a useful tool because it serves as a self-teaching tool for uh, uh, people and they're directly able to visualize how much energy is being consumed. This could not only uh, help them uh, 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 um, use their air conditioners at higher set point, it could also facilitate participation in demand response programs and also uh, it can encourage consumers to invest in more energy efficient appliances. So to conclude, uh, our intention with this Runner 24 campaign is to promote the adoption of adaptive thermal comfort standards in India. We also hope that the learnings from this campaign can support Bureau of Energy Efficiency in formulating or refurbishing its ongoing as well as future campaigns. And the campaign also supports the Government of India Lifestyle for Environment Initiative. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Simrat. Any questions for of clarification on Simrat's presentation? Okay, not seeing any immediately. Um, so I'd like now to turn to
Energy programs. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, at that stage, I'll hand over to Mary to do her presentation. Thank you. I see that was my fault. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm very thankful to be included in this really fantastic conversation. Um, I represent OPower, which, as you heard, is a, an energy engagement platform, and we are part of Oracle Energy and Water. And what I hope to share with you today is there is a, another way to look at behavior change. Uh, in contrast to a campaign, what OPower pioneered was behavior change as a resource, changing how people use energy in a personalized scalable and most importantly measurable way something we've heard um, several times uh, today let's see if i can get this there we go wonderful so the foundation of our approach at opower uh, comes from a behavior science principle called normative comparison you've heard it referred to similarly um, already today and that's that we change our behavior in order to fit in and whether we like it or not, it does work, um, and it works across cultures and it works across continents. Um, but it only works when we are providing consumers with very personalized view into how they compare to their peers. And we reach people that way where they are and not where we necessarily want them to be. And we do that by sending proactive communications to nearly everyone with the exception of a control group in order to measure the counterfactual. So, but for this intervention, how much energy is used? So, you know, it's not media, it's not weather, it's not price, it's the behavioral intervention that caused the shift in usage. And in the 15 years since our founding, we've deployed these programs around the world. We've been most successful in the United States because the entity that owns the energy consumer relationship is most often the distribution utility. Uh, and they often have a mandate or incentive to measurably change energy consumption. And what this image gives you an idea of is what these personalized communications look like. Um, and actually, I think you've seen a presentation with some of our imagery already today. Um, you'll see a similar homes comparison in the bar chart. This is the normative comparison approach that I mentioned, and that's what captures interest. And then the consumer is presented very simple actions that they can take that are specific to their home. And while most of the energy savings actions are free, they are all designed to be easy. And when you reach millions of people, in an effective way, even when they're taking small actions, in aggregate, there's a major impact. And what you can see here is that in the US alone, we've saved 33 terawatt hours of energy. And these programs reduce peak demand at the same time, 418 megawatts in the US. And while we love Denmark, and I appreciated your presentation, that's equivalent to taking Denmark off of the grid. Thank you. <laughs> so what's behind these personalized communications is a combination of behavior science, and I mentioned one aspect of that before, combined with artificial intelligence. And we use AI because connecting with people on a personal level is incredibly complex. And our AI is continually learning what kinds of energy uh, actions and information that consumers need and want, and then offers it to them. And what always blows my mind is the sheer volume of data that we've processed. Over two and a half trillion meter reads, and we add about 1.4 billion each day. But the real point is, the platform absorbs complexity in order to facilitate attention and action. And so behavior change is actually now a cornerstone of an effective demand side management program um, or portfolio in the United States. 
Um, and in states with energy efficiency targets, our program makes up at least half of the savings goal. And in some places in California, for example, um, the majority of the savings. And what we've estimated is that if these programs were deployed in the EU, residential consumers could save 10 terawatt hours of energy, which is equivalent to taking 18 natural gas fired power plants off the grid for a year. And at the same time, you capture the coincident peak reductions when you need them the most. And this reduced demand is about equivalent to 12 billion euros in consumer bill savings. Now, as some Americans would say, not this American, but as some would say, this isn't our first rodeo. Um, and in around 2011, there was interest from European countries on deploying these kinds of programs. And we had several successful pilots in the market. I want to show you one example. This is an example, a case study um, at EDF in France. Um, this was a small pilot. It was focused partially on consumers with smart meters and partially on consumers without them. And it resulted in 2.8 gigawatt hours of savings, in addition to a real shift um, in consumer sentiment and feeling supported um, by their utility. So if this worked before, uh, why aren't these programs deployed in Europe today, um, particularly given the, uh, the current crisis? And I want to get straight uh, to, to why that is, which, which is what we're often asked. Why don't we see behavior shifting from a marketing campaign to something that's a measurable and scalable resource? Well, first, you heard about data. <laughs> um, you need access to meter data. Um, second, you need the ability to proactively communicate with consumers in a personalized way. Um, and this third one, both, both of those lead you to this most important reason, um, which is retail suppliers that can do the first two items above really don't have a sufficient incentive or mandate to invest in solutions that do this. And this third factor, let's see, I did my fun animation. Yeah, there we go. Um, this third factor is the primary reason these programs are ubiquitous in the US um, and not deployed in Europe. Most US consumers are served by a regulated utility while most Europeans are served by a competitive retail supplier. And as we've seen, unfortunately, many suppliers in Europe are barely able to stay in business, let alone invest in robust customer solutions that result in real change. But there is a third way, um, which is an approach funded and directed by government, but deployed by retail suppliers. And after Fukushima, we used exactly this approach in Japan. So we had the Ministry of Environment that wanted to do whatever it could uh, to manage demand. And with a liberalized retail market, Japanese suppliers had no reason to do this and actually um, would lose revenue uh, by doing this. So the ministry paid the retail suppliers to deploy a behavioral energy efficiency program co-branded by the ministry itself. And I wanna point out just a few important things about the Japanese pilot. Um, some things shouldn't surprise you given Mr. Uh, Ogawa's comments earlier this morning, and then I will, I will close. I wanna point out that Japanese households use less than half of the energy as US households do. And as you heard this morning, immediately after Fukushima, that, that decreased by another 10% based on voluntary behavior changes. And this program was still effective. Uh, it achieved a sustained 2% reduction in energy and avoided 47,000 tons of carbon at the same time. So again, I wanna thank you and especially thank the IEA for having me here and allowing me to share the O-Power story. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mary, that was great. Um, again, I'll look briefly around the room in case there are any immediate questions of Clarification, yes, I do, Turkey. A quick question, how do you address privacy concerns? That's a great question, and that's the, the primary reason that 
the entity that has the relationship with the energy consumer, so whichever level of utility or kind of utility you have, has an arrangement. Um, and in Europe, for example, a contract with the consumer to be able to communicate with and use their data. Um, in the US, there's a concept of primary purpose use of data, where if you are um, the distribution utility required to save energy, that's one of your primary purposes, and you can use and leverage the data to drive that outcome. But the data is not ours. It is not OPower's um, data. It is processed and leveraged through our engagement platform and sent back through the utility to the consumer. All right. Thank you. I don't see any other immediate hands going up. So thank you, Mary. We'll move on to our final speaker, which is C. Rotman from New Zealand. Um, it's very late in New Zealand, so thank you to C for joining us. C has been working in the area of behavior change for over a decade now. Uh, she is a task leader of one of the users TCP tasks on hard to reach consumers, but has been designing, developing and implementing behavior change campaigns using a mixture of quantitative and qualitative approaches in various countries now for, as I was saying, over a decade. Uh, she works with at Sustainable Energy Advice in New Zealand. So C, I'll hand the floor over to you. Kia ora, David. I hope the screen share is working. Hang on, no, it's not because I need to, oh, apologies. Um, Zoom, share screen. I hope it's working now. Um, shout if it's not. Um, Kia ora koutou. Um, good evening from the future. It's almost midnight here in Aotearoa. And thank you so much for this really wonderful opportunity to participate in this important and really informative session. Um, why can't I move on? Um, very quickly, just want to note that we um, focus on residential and non-residential energy users who are hard to reach. And we particularly focus on interventions that uh, are geared at changing their energy using behaviors. So I want to give a very quick overview on the evolution of our research before I critique much of what we heard already today, not because any of these speakers don't know what they're talking about, because of course they do, um, but because our research has shown that they likely miss out on engaging a really significant number of energy users with the current strategies. And I totally have to do a mea culpa because uh, the previous phases of my research have done so as well. Um, so this is relatively new learnings. Um, we started off uh, with Task 24, um, global research collaboration on behavior change, looked at various models and theories of behavior change, how well they applied to the real world and quickly realized that it wasn't really about finding the right models or theories, but that humans within the energy system were actually the most important part of developing strategies that work. And so we also learned that we're dealing with a highly complex rather than a complicated system here, which means that computational power alone are not gonna help us save these problems. And so phase two of our task was all about the people, the energy end users, of course, but more importantly, we focused on how we could facilitate multi-stakeholder collaboration and break down the silos and ivory towers that we're so often forced into. Um, and for that, we did field research testing and relied on the power of storytelling and narratives amongst other tools. But then we realized that even these very successful efforts managed to ignore what we thought was about a third of energy users who were often called hard to reach. And so our current task, task delved deeply into characterizing these audiences and to our great shock and dismay, we found that it's actually more like more than two thirds of energy users that fall into these categories, probably like three quarters of energy users. Um, and we found that there was a lot of under-researched diversity and many different impacts of scale on those who suffered in hidden hardship. And that is uh, this very deeply struggling group is what we're likely and hope to focus on next. Um, so we have a very broad definition of what is a hard to reach energy user on purpose because we didn't want to miss anyone. 
Um, most people immediately jump to the conclusion that it's low income people in energy poverty, but it's a lot more complex than that. Um, vulnerable households are not just those who are low, low income, but those who suffer from various intersectionalities. And then there are, of course, also high income and high consuming households. There are commercial and residential renters and their landlords who are hard to reach and especially small businesses. So all of them are hard to reach for different reasons. They have different barriers and they all need different tailored engagement strategies. So we're really talking about a huge number of energy users who are not using this essential and limited resource efficiently, which of course is a massive problem right now. I mean, it's always been a problem, but now it's really coalescing with the climate collapse and um, you know, the energy poverty crisis. And so um, just as an aside, there are also very often similar, the same groups um, who have been really hard to engage in vaccination efforts and the public health campaigns with COVID because they are often more likely to rebel against top-down decrees. So that is something to really acknowledge as well from a policymaker perspective. So key findings are that those who are most commonly mentioned in research in the literature are low income households, renters and small businesses, but those who probably have the greatest energy saving potential are actually almost the flip side of that, high income, high consuming landlords, commercial building operators, audience size estimates, estimates are much greater than what we thought. And of course, the, both the COVID and energy crisis impacts were massive on these audiences and have probably increased their size even more. So um, they're under-researched, they're undervalued, they're underserved, and we're not focusing enough on energy justice, inequity, and stigma that they experience. So now I'm talking about some of those groups who are really experiencing this. And after almost four years of focusing on those different audience characteristics of hard to reach energy users, we finally came up with a way of visualizing the complexity. And as I said earlier, being low income or even vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean that you're hard to reach. Um, both the difficulty to engage them and their increasing hardship come into play with that hidden group of energy use demographics. At the outermost circle here in purple are those squeezed middle households who don't own assets like property or shares. And they're really feeling the sting right now. They're hidden for several reasons, psychologically, because they can't yet admit that they are basically becoming the working poor and in danger of losing their status. That makes them really hard to reach for community groups who normally help the poor. Behaviorally, because they rather reduce their heating or make other adjustments, such as switching providers or going on prepay or even loan sharks, rather than falling into debt, that makes them hard to reach for industry. And then, of course, also financially, because they're ineligible for the current ben benefits that apply to lower income users, and that makes them hard to reach for government and social ser service agencies. But the next group is this one, which are the next three cycles of Dante's Inferno of Hell, as I like to call it. Um, and we really want to try and help anyone from these outer circles from slipping into those socially mar marginalized segments as the hardship and the hard to reach this compound really quickly. And these outcasts, uh, we grouped into three groups, uh, three subgroups, and there are a lot of intersectionalities, obviously, between them. And especially that last group, the Ill illegalized or criminalized um, energy users, can be really hard to empathize with, empathize with, which is why they're often willfully ignored or overlooked, both by industry and policymakers. Um, when they're designing awareness and engagement campaigns, and it's it's understandable. And yet, of course, all of them still have a basic human right to affordable access to energy. Uh, often they don't. And that also means that some of them remain hidden on purpose because they've been treated quite badly by society and all that stigma. Um, also need to highlight that not it's not just hardship, um, those in hardship who are hidden. So this is a diagram that shows high income and or high consuming energy user. So the outer, the outer two circles are more those who are in hardship, like for example, large immigrant families that live in functional and structural, structural overcrowding or student flatters in large share houses. Industry only knows about the key account holders, but there could be many dependents that are also suffering. Um, those energy users who have high or very high income and or assets and over consume their fair share without paying for the externalities that contribute to the climate crisis are also impossibly hard to reach, even though they aren't in any hardship. And they may be good 
good groups to focus on right now in this crisis. Very quick um, note to just highlight the two pink ones in the middle, they aren't hard to reach, but they will consume more energy than low income users per capita. And finally, just a quick note, this concept also applies to the non-residential sector. And although those in these two innermost circles are likely to be both in a lot of hardship and hard to reach, and they actually overlap with the residential sector in some way. So again, groups probably very important to focus on. So we learned some things. We know what works. Um, it's really important to follow a strong co-design process with other stakeholders in other sectors and not just start with the engagement strategy or the design element without having done our homework first. Because most of the examples we talked about today talked about really good content and delivery strategies. But it's also our research shows that it's really important to spend some time on the landscape and stakeholder assessments to see what has already been done and what is known and what is not known. And probably most importantly, to really clearly defining your target audiences and behaviors. And they are much more complex than we think or understand um, from kind of our silo perspective. Um, and obviously, evaluation needs to go beyond simple um, KPIs to evaluating actual behavioral changes, not just self professed ones, knowledge improvements, and also persistent habit changes, because a lot of evaluation doesn't look at um, behavioral persistence. We also know what needs to be done, and that is to acknowledge that there is systemic underlying bias. The standards of, professional, of professionalism that we work under are heavily defined by a series of characteristics that do institutionalize whiteness and westernness as both normal and superior. And so it's hard to accurately characterize or define our target audiences if our gender, ethnicity, or class status means that we actually have little insights into or understanding of the lived experience. And the energy system is obviously quite white, male, and middle class dominated. And so we followed silver bullet solutions that were presented by engineers, by economists, by technologists for over half a century. The system is still failing. And so maybe it's time that we also start listening to social scientists, non-Western and otherwise minority experts, be, which who have received a lot less funding and attention um, by decision makers. And, you know, I think, I think we need to hear those voices too. It's really probably most crucial out of anything that we've done, particularly the field research has shown us that, also reviewing vast amounts of literature and doing case study analysis all around the world. You need to engage trusted community middle actors. I haven't really heard that in any of the examples today. This is hard because they are also extremely hard to reach, especially for those of us who have been locked in our silos or ivory towers for too long, because it takes really quite a bit of time to build tr trusted relationships with these frontline heroes who were those key essential workers that we clapped for a couple of years ago, they are really underpaid, they're overworked, they're undervalued by society and whatever additional burden we place upon them, is it asking them to recruit or identify people to research or give us their data? We need to be very careful how we approach this and uh, their needs need to be considered really um, first and foremost. Finally, this is a really culmination of all I've said before. We need to listen and understand first and then fix and come up with strategies and solutions. If we really want to help those who suffer the most and need urgent interventions right now, we need to ask them and their trusted support groups in their communities and on the front line how this help should be offered rather than making it up top down. Um, otherwise, it's going to be band aid solutions and ambulances at the bottom of the cliff, or worse, mass freezing, starvation, rioting, or even death, even in our Western societies and just this winter. So I really hope we will not let this happen on our watch. Um, and thank you so much again for this opportunity to talk to you guys. Namihi Nui. Thank you, C. Um, again, I'll ask quickly if there are any points of clarification for C before we move into the wider discussion. Um, and thank you, C, for if you like flipping the perspective to a certain extent, I think that it's it's easy to not really engage deeply with the stress that the energy crisis is putting people under. And I think it's a very timely reminder to, to understand and look at this from the perspective of 
a range of people who may be overlooked. So what I'd like to do is to open this up in a sec to questions from the Energy Efficiency Working Party officials or those colleagues who are, who are joining us on Zoom. Um, so just briefly a couple of reflections, I think, from my side. And I've kind of broken these down into four areas. So I think there's a questions around campaign targeting. And these were particularly highlighted by C. So how do we nuance our messaging to avoid adverse unintended consequences of our campaigns? And as part of that, how do we keep track of very rapidly changing audience segments? We come into this with a set of audience segments that have been developed probably before the energy crisis. The demographic makeup and constitution of those segments will be changing very quickly. And keeping track of that is going to be a challenge. So we need to think about how we do that. Questions around campaign duration that have been raised. So um, what do we know about campaign fatigue? How long do the changes last for? And how do we make behavior changes that stick? Another question from that is, if this is a crisis and we're asking for crisis response, are we asking people to stick? Or is this something that is a temporary message that we want people to respond to, say, during the next 12 to 18 months? So we need to think about these questions of duration. Campaign evaluation, so questions around what constitutes best practice in measuring the outcomes. We've seen a range of different outcomes, both final outcomes in terms of demand, but intermediate and proxy outcomes in terms of a range of different, um, maybe social media metrics or others. So what is best practice to measure outcomes? And what proportion of our campaign budgets should we spend? So if we think about the standard advice from um, you know, people who've been working in campaign evaluation in the US, they recommend say 10, five to 10% of the budget goes on evaluation. We should think about how that is expended. There's also questions about campaign transferability. Um, we saw in Simrat's presentation, looking at the polio campaign and lessons from that, but there are lessons from our response to COVID. How transferable are those? But also, how do we transfer lessons between countries and cultural contexts? So these are, I think, some of the important questions that we need to collectively wrestle with. So what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. So both from within the room and those online, um, I might ask Jack to help moderate questions that are, are coming through online. Any initial questions from within the room? Yes, certainly, Turkey. I received a question about the presentations today, Netherlands and I think Danish one. The campaign title is like ordering the people, you know, cut the usage, reduce the usage. Uh, is there semantic or command of words that's helpful for these campaigns? Is ordering helps? In Turkey, it's much more political. When government orders, it becomes crazy. So do any of our presenters from the second session want to tackle the, the nature of the phrasing, particularly in a cultural context, I think? I don't know, but if you give me some money, I can start a study. But I suppose, I suppose you, you could do some experimentation. But I think it's probably very culturally dependent as well. What will work in uh, the Netherlands or Denmark will maybe not be one-to-one -one transferable into, into Turkey. And just to add as well, I think there are very many different motivations for saving energy. And those might vary between different societies uh, as well. You know, like there are maybe some cultures in which you can, you know, appeal to religious motivations, some that there are other types of things that you can appeal to. And of course, 
um, this is also important to test and evaluate to see uh, whether that's the case or not. Okay, any further thoughts or responses? Yes, certainly. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for the for the question. Um, perhaps um, a clarification from the from the Dutch side that um, the the English translation flip the switch sounds indeed like an order. The Dutch translation um, is a bit more nuanced in the sense that it tries to give a sense of we're doing this together. Um, so you should also flip the switch, just like government is doing, just like companies are doing. Um, so the goal was not to give a direct order, especially for political reasons and, and, and just what what customers or what the consumers want to hear, uh, but also to create a sense of, uh, of togetherness. And I think the Danish example was, uh, was similar to that. Okay, so online we have Tom Halpen. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? It's actually just to respond to the uh, th that particular question from the delegate from Turkey. And just to say that we did play around with a number of options with this. In fact, at one stage, we flipped from using reduce your use to reduce our use. However, we felt it was important to assign a certain personal responsibility to everyone and within the uh, slogan to also build in the call to action. Uh, now, having said that, our campaign was complemented by a number of actions that also showed what others were doing. So while we were asking individuals to reduce their individual use, we were also demonstrating that business and public bodies and communities were doing a lot as well. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I also see online that Dari McCoy has got a hand up. Do you want to jump in, Dari? Sure. Thanks, David. And thanks to all the speakers for really interesting presentations. Um, I have a question around the evaluation. I, I guess it's, 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 it's to all speakers. Any suggestions or recommendations around how we get at causality for assessing these campaigns? Because, you know, in, in an ideal world, we would have a randomized controlled trial. Potentially, we would have comparable baseline data that we could use and we would have a, you know, a randomized control and treatment group. In this case, we don't have a randomized control trial. You know, everyone is going to see the messages. We don't have comparable baseline periods because prices have risen so much. And, you know, the context has changed so much. And really interested to hear people's thoughts on, you know, how do we get as close as possible to causality for ass assessing the impact of some of these campaigns? And I guess a further difficulty is, you know, problems in accessing individual metered data so um yeah really interested to hear your thoughts i can i can try to answer that first uh if that's okay so um when you're not able to actually sort of randomly allocate interventions in the real world and track actual energy consumption data the second best thing um unless you find some other type of natural experiment or something like that that you could look at is that you simply conduct an online experiment and so, for example, if you have some sort of message that you're aiming to test, what you could do is recruit, you know, a representative sample to a survey. You can then, um, you know, randomly expose them to this message or some different versions of the message. And then you can record how attitudes change, their beliefs change, their intentions change. It's, of course, not as good as actually, like, tracking energy consumption, but it can, I think, give a good steer with regards to what policy is likely to be most effective. And I think it's important to say that we can even go beyond things like um, like stated measures, you know, and actually record behaviors within such experiments as well. So you could, for example, record whether um, users like um, click a link that takes them to somewhere that where they can like uh, and, you know, request a device be installed or something like that too. So you can try to like integrate outcomes that are uh, a bit closer to actual energy consumption than just saying that, yes, I'm gonna consume more or less or something like that. Um. All right, thank you, Jesper. I see, see, you have your hand up. Would you like to come in on this? Um, yeah, kia ora. Um, just from the perspective of those hard to reach energy users I was talking about, um, neither randomized controlled trials nor surveys nor online, um, you know, any, any high-tech measures probably won't capture them um, very well, if at all. Um, 
And it's actually quite important to not discard qualitative measures that are more complex, more intensive, but can actually give you a really, really, really deep and broad flavor of who you're talking about and um, what the actual energy saving activities are and the barriers and needs particularly are. And there is a lot of good information not tapped into with those frontline and community providers who are mostly not energy professionals, but they work in the social services and the health services, education services. And yet um, they have access to getting to some of those energy users that the techniques that we really talked about today probably won't. So I wouldn't discard qualitative investigation as well and more deep investigation. Thank you both. Thank you, C. Um, yeah, I would personally completely agree on the need for both approaches. I think in changes, in times where we have very rapid changes, it's easy to misinterpret some of the quantitative findings unless we can wrap them in a, in a qualitative context. Um, I have a burning desire to ask Mary from Opower to come in on this one, <laughs> partly because I know some of the history. So Mary, do you have any <laughs> Well, I think it was part of the distinction between a campaign rather than a program. Um, I, you know, you've heard ideas of how to potentially measure impact surveys. You can measure clicks, um, you know, sort of eyeballs is, <laughs> is one way to look at it. But, um, you know, unless you're doing randomized control trial, which is what we do, and actually measuring the specific intervention. I, I don't know how you get to that truly um, quantitative, you know, it's RCT in this field is known as the gold standard um, for measurement and evaluation of behavioral intervention. Um, so unless you can measure it uh, that way. Yeah, I think we. I know we're talking about the methods for evaluation, but a question I have is, uh, when does one evaluate, right? You're, you have a campaign, let's say it runs for two, three months. Do you evaluate after that? Or do you wait a couple of months or years to, act, to actually assess if there has been any change? So if anybody had any uh, thoughts about that, like what is the correct timing for evaluation? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that, that I have the answer to the correct timing, within the Nudge project, we at least plan to do evaluation of energy consumption after the pilots have finished to see if there's any long-term effects that, that can be measured. And I think another important part of the discussion here is the effect sizes and the sample sizes. So we tend to, um, you, need, you need large samples of people to be able to measure those, those impacts. And we have a problem, I think in many of the projects right now, is we have external shock that is, such a big effect that it's going to be really hard for us to disentangle the impact of the the energy crisis on the impacts uh, and the impact of your behavioral intervention because both groups even in a randomized controlled trial will change their behavior the hope is that the people in the experimental group will change it even more but it's not clear to me whether that effect size will be able will be able to find that um, so large effect sizes i think is important and also maybe doing a, a smaller experiment with more people. So we're not trying to do everything, but let's say we, we, we try to do, have a thousand participants and one behavioral intervention, as opposed to five behavioral interventions spread across smaller populations, which will give you a little bit more of a robust answer to whether your behavioral intervention actually is measurable. Thank you, Peter. Um, Mary, yes, I'll give the floor to you, but also on, in responding, could you talk a little bit about how might we capture unintended consequences of campaigns? Because I think there's two issues here. I think this, this first one of quantification is hugely important, but capturing unintended consequences, I think we need to collectively reflect on as well. That's great. Thank you for that question. I, I Before I get to that, I, I just wanted to add to the timing piece. And this, again, is specific to our experience and the kinds of interventions that, that we do. But 
Um, you know, we have found it takes some time. I think the timing question is super interesting to capture it, attention and action. You know, depending on you know the program, it could be a few months, it could be several months, um, and so we tend to look at an annual. Um, look into the impact of these kinds of interventions. Um, what I think is very interesting is that if you have this continual feedback loop and continue to do interventions as you learn about specific usage consumption changes, different opportunities for savings, those can continue. I mean, we've had programs um, with the same groups of people for over 10 years and are still capturing treatment versus control impacts equivalent to what they were when the treatment started. So I think that, you know, you asked that question earlier too, is this about a moment in time um, or is this something that is could be potentially more sustainable? Um, and then in terms of unintended consequences, I think that's the real importance of the, the personalization component. Um, and, you know, a bit to the, to the hard to reach consumers, you, don't want to be sending the same kind of message to someone who is experiencing energy poverty um, as you would to someone who has quite um, you know, flexibility to save. Um, and I don't know if that's what you're inferring to about unintended consequences, potentially asking people to do things that um, could be harm, harmful um, in their own household. And that's why it matters um, to understand the individual energy user um, and who they are and what they can do. Um, but if that's not what you meant by unintended consequences, please please do uh, clarify. Okay, so I think that's certainly an important component. I think we would we might want to also understand if there were potential social groups that were you know creating some kind of backlash against this. So are messages being misread? are are there risks to campaigns from subgroups, particularly on social media, amplifying certain messages which could ultimately come to undermine the efficacy of the campaign? And how might we try to understand that? I'll clarify then my response to that. Um, we've had about, so, so these programs, because they're proactive, you are proactively reaching out to someone. We've have, we have about 1%, generally speaking, across cultures say they don't want to be in the program, opt out of, of telling me what I should do to, to manage my, my energy. And there is often a small percentage of the population, um, even if they stay in the program, don't like <laughs> um, the, the information and, and being informed. And what we found is that's so small relative to the rest of the population and the program's ability to reduce demand that it's almost always overshadowed. Um, but we have done a lot of experiments. I heard someone mention, we, we call it sort of personas too, you know, our different personas. Can you determine if a certain household will respond more to environment, environmental messaging versus cost? Um, and I think that's sort of still an evolving area. Thank you. We've got two hands up online. So I think I'll go to Jesper and then C. So Jesper. I was going to respond to both the sort of the timing of the evaluation question, but also the unintended consequences. So for unintended consequences, it's unfortunately quite difficult to measure a lot of those using the sort of standard randomized control trials uh, that we use for message testing, mostly because we don't have access to data often other than just like the extent to which people consume more or less, or perhaps in some cases we have data on whether consumers contacted the utility to complain or something like that as well, which could be helpful. Um, and so what we do, and I'm going to harp on about online experiments, is that what you can do in, in conjunction with conducting proper randomized control trials is you can also conduct sort of message testing online where you randomly expose people to different messages. And then you just record attitudes and things like that, you know, and ask them how it makes them feel if they've been exposed to a certain message. Um, so that's just the sort of thought about unintended consequences. Um, in terms of like how how the timing should be for an evaluation. I think that depends very much on what you're evaluating. Are you trying to evaluate the policy that generates behavior like habit change? Of course, you need a longer time frame for that. And we know that you know it takes time sometimes to build habits, but also we know that behavioral messages uh, occasionally lose their bite. You know, after a certain amount of time, people get used to them. 
So it's important to sort of have a longer time frame there. Um, if, if you have sort of like a, a technology uptake uh, intervention where it's like a one-off message, quite typically you'd find that if you do that kind of campaign and if it's a one-off thing, you, 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 any effect you're gonna record is within the next few weeks. So you don't have to run those for as long. However, there's an important caveat there, which is that um, let's say you design some intervention that gets lots of people to sign up to like getting a smart meter or something within the for first two months. Um, it's also important to look at the longer time frame because what you actually might be doing isn't you know actually increasing the share that signed up at all, but you might just be pushing that forward in time. And that's something I've seen in quite a few experiments as well that um, you know, yes, if you look at one month, the intervention is a huge success, but then over time, you know, the control group catches up as well. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, thank you. C. Yeah, I just want to um, point out the world's largest ever behavioral change campaign that just happened over the last three years with COVID and how successful more or less, we were in some parts of the world compared with others for cultural reasons, um, for political reasons. And then, of course, what happened and how quickly those campaigns were completely derailed by disinformation, by culture wars, by, you know, political messaging. And that was about saving lives. Um, I mean, we're talking about that now, too, but, you know, um, it, I think it's really important to not um, underestimate the impact that those counter campaigns can actually have and how very well-meaning and well-designed top-down interventions um, can get some massive backlash if, like, you know, the wrong group gets the wrong idea that Bill Gates lives in your smart meter and this is just a big, you know, new world order thing or whatever. And suddenly you have 30% of people who are like never going to do this again. It's it's not something I would discount seeing how many people are willing to, you know, now vote quite, you know, populist authoritarian regimes and stuff like that. We've really, it is something that I think we should all take very seriously when we are desi designing those kind of um strategies, especially when they're very national, big campaigns that are aimed at all energy users. Um, I, I don't really have an answer of how you deal with it, but I, 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 these are unintended consequences that I certainly wouldn't ignore. Thank you, C, and thank you for actually a segue into an area of questioning I'd like to open up. This question about the transferability of findings from say, health campaigns, as, as we saw again with Simrat's example on polio, um, but also transferring learnings between countries and cultural contexts. We sit in the IEA. Our remit in many ways is to learn through international comparative analysis. But obviously, from what we saw this morning, there is a lot of cultural specificity in the way you frame these campaigns. So I'd be interested in any reflections from our speakers on how we might understand which elements of campaigns are transferable between contexts and how they might think about transferring a campaign and, and then which elements of, um, if you like, fine tuning of that may need to be undertaken as it moves from country and context or between domains like health and energy. Any reflections from our speakers? Happy to weigh in on this. Um, you know, I, I think the the interesting piece about the social norms um, component that that anchors what we do is that uh, it works cross culturally, but norms will be different um, in each culture. So, so it's a really critical part of what we do is ensuring that you are matching whatever norming you're using in terms of what kinds of behaviors and what is expected of you and your peers in each country. And, and, but, but the 
the basic founding of it remains the same for humans, <laughs> um, uh, regardless of, of where you are, as long as it's localized is sort of the terminology that we use. Thank you. Uh, Jesper, I'll, I'll come back to Philip also, but Jesper. I, I, think, I think it's a boring but simple answer is that we need lots of evaluation in different contexts to know what generalizes and what doesn't. And, you know, and through countless behavioral experiments, there are certain general principles that, you know, time and time again turn out to be important to follow. For example, we have to have a clear call, call to action and things like that. And I think these things that have again and again proven successful are important to then, to then integrate and that we know that we can then, you know, transfer cross-culturally. Um, but there are also instances of interventions that just don't work. I mean, for norms, for example, there are examples where people have been trying to get uh, others to pay their tax on time by referring to sort of the compliance rates in your area, like in saying, oh, you've, you've paid late. Um, uh, you know, 50% of people in your area uh, have paid on time. You know, in, 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 a, in an instance when it's 50%, um, telling people that that might actually reduce compliance because that might actually be a lower degree than what they initially thought. Whereas if you tell them it's 90% um, because maybe you live in a higher compliance area, maybe then it works better. So um, yeah, I think it's it's important to to sort of continually test and to sort of when you do norms and things like this, as was previously mentioned, that you think about the local context and culture as well when you when you apply them. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, Philippos. To, um, to add some insights from the Nudge project, one of the things we did after the survey was to come up with at least six profiles of energy consumers. So we see that some consumers are very well informed and are willing to undertake some measures. Others simply don't care at all. They're completely indifferent. Others want to do, but don't know how to act. And there's a, uh, there's a range between them. So. While this applies on the individual level, with some being more individualistic, others being more uh, aware of consequences, others being more socially uh, engaged, this would also apply to some extent on uh, the messaging at the nation level or like certain regions. So you would have populations that are more concerned about what their neighbors do, and you would have other societies that are extremely individualistic and they only care about my own comfort. So messaging needs to be tailored um, and it's rather easy to derive those profiling messages. There are many techniques. We came up with one. Um, other studies could use the ocean model, for example, or similar. Um, so there are ways to target messaging to populations in a way that will be more, uh, more effective. Um, and with social media, of course, you can also have even more targeted in addition to general advertisements. So that's the two cents from the Nudge project. Thank you, yes. Uh, so on how transferable these learnings are, so uh, I think it depends on what are the key enablers or barriers of behavior change. If they are somewhat similar, I think le learnings are transferable. So just to give an example, we are focusing on AC set point and Japan had a very successful uh, cool biz program. Uh, on this, on um, AC set point temperature, but their their barrier or enablers were very different. It was about your business attire. That is not something very which is very applicable in India. So we couldn't take that learning. But I I saw uh, somebody presented today that a recommended set point was shown in green color, but when it went off, it was shown in red color. I think that's a that's a great learning for us as well, and something we can also apply. Right. Thank you. Um, we're coming towards the close of this session. Do we have any other immediate questions? I'm not seeing any. I think just one thing that has really struck me throughout this is I think that the more quickly things change, it's arguable the more quick, the, the more responsive our programs need to be but arguably the more we need to invest in evaluation and feedback of those programs in close to real time. Because I think that we cannot assume that the future is like the past. Um, this is probably going to accelerate, unfortunately, over the course of this decade. 
Um, but also, I think it seems that we need a robust combination of quantitative and qualitative approaches for program evaluation. Um, so in order to try to understand the impact, then it seems like RCTs for some sectors are the gold standard and will work well. Um, I think that we do need to think carefully about the impacts on those sectors that will likely or potentially have adverse impacts. Um, but we also need to make sure we wrap around our quantitative metrics the capacity to capture unintended consequences across a range of areas. So it makes our jobs arguably more complicated, but undoubtedly more important. Um, and I think there is an important role for the IEA in understanding this question about aggregating best practice and understanding transferability between domains and between cultural contexts. So with that, I think we've come to the end of the second session. At this stage, I would like to hand back, I think, to Jack. Right. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to David for chairing. Um, we'll take a short five minute break now before the closing session. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody, for coming back to this third and final portion of our special workshop on behavior change. Um, we are very lucky to be joined now uh, by uh, Dr. Anthony Lizovich, um, the founder and director of the Yale Program on Climate Change and Communication and a senior research scientist at the Yale School of the Environment. He'll give us a, a short keynote, um, and this is particularly timely in that he is an expert on public climate change and environmental beliefs, attitudes, policy preferences, and behavior, and the psychological, cultural, and political factors that shape them. So um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, sorry, it's not in person, and I'm really sorry I missed the earlier sessions. Love the last bit of discussion I just heard there about market segments and social norms and values, uh, really important stuff. But here I'm gonna, I've been asked to really take a global scale view. So I'm gonna sit, take uh, the big picture, uh, but before I do, let me share my screen and make sure our technology works. And so can I get a yay that yes, you can see me and hear me. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Okay, so today I'm gonna address three really big questions. First, what is the role of the public in climate action? Second, what is the role of communication in driving climate action? And third, how are publics around the world thinking and feeling about climate change? So let's start with that first question. What is the role of the public in climate action? So this question is much, much bigger than just public opinion, which many people think of as just a measure of public support for government policies. That is, of course, very important, but that's not all that I'm talking about here. This question is really about all the climate-related decisions and behaviors of more than 8 billion people worldwide. So you are all familiar with these kinds of uh, graphics uh, charting the different potential projections uh, or scenarios of how the world may warm in this coming century. And as you can see, there's a huge variance between an absolute worst case catastrophic scenario and a best case still suffering and bad, but, uh, but much more tolerable uh, situation as in like the 1.5 degree target. But my point when showing you this chart, which you've seen them probably a million times, is that that delta, that difference between worst case and best case, the single biggest source of scientific uncertainty in these projections, in other words, estimates of how much the world is gonna warm, is human behavior. As one recent paper on climate scenarios begins, the future climate depends on future human behavior. So as an American, one of our greatest leaders, President Abraham Lincoln, once famously said, Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So what does that mean in the context of climate change? How does public sentiment or public knowledge, decisions, and behavior affect climate change? Well, as you all know better than I do, uh, pretty much everything we do as human beings affects the global climate. This is just a graphic from Project Drawdown showing all the different sectors that basically need to be decarbonized. Um, so pretty much everything we do affects the climate, though critically, there are enormous differences in the carbon footprints of different people within and across nations, which raise critical questions of equity, fairness, and justice. But at the global scale, Humanity needs to make a rapid transition from a 19th century energy system where we are still digging stuff up out of the ground like coal, oil, and gas and setting it on fire to power our societies to a 21st century energy system where we harness the energy flowing around us at all times from the sun, from the wind, from the tides, from the atom, and from the heat beneath our feet. So first, how do we use, waste, or conserve energy at home and on the road, especially those of us in the developed world? Just consider the transportation choices billions of people make every day, choosing to use motorcycles, cars, trucks, trains, buses, ships, airplanes. All of these transportation choices and systems are still predominantly driven by the burning of fossil fuels. Yet in the next decade, hundreds of millions of consumers worldwide will need to choose to replace their petrol burning of automobiles with electric vehicles, or choose lifestyles that don't require an automobile at all. 
Will people choose and use more climate-friendly transportation? Second is consumer behavior, because everything we buy, from products like computers, cell phones, furniture, clothing, and toothpaste, to services like health, banking, and insurance are still produced by value chains reliant on fossil fuels. Will billions of consumers choose to buy the products and services that are better for the climate? What kinds of homes and buildings will we choose to buy, retrofit, and live in? Single family homes, apartments, skyscrapers? How will they be designed? Will we choose to live in urban, suburban, or rural locations? All of these decisions will have enormous consequences for the climate. What kinds of food will we grow and eat? Food and agriculture, of course, are major sources of carbon pollution. For example, will we continue to eat more beef, the production of which currently generates substantial carbon pollution, or instead choose more plant-rich diets? Our collective food choices and behaviors already have enormous impacts on the climate, as well as our health, our landscapes, and other species. How will we power our lives? For example, the world basically needs to electrify everything. Our vehicles and our buildings, including the ways we as individuals heat and cool our homes, cook our food, wash our clothes, and heat water, just to name a few daily activities. And this will also require critical but infrequent decisions, like replacing a gas-fired furnace with a heat pump, to everyday decisions in the kitchen. How can we empower consumers to make these more sustainable choices? Third is our social behavior, which includes communication. Do we talk about climate change and energy with our friends and family members? Do we hear about it in the media and from our leaders? Talk is not a substitute for action, but it is a critical and necessary condition for action. If we don't talk about climate change, then for most people, the issue is out of sight and out of mind, and certainly doesn't seem like an important issue, let alone an urgent one. And this, of course, includes social norms. Uh, my colleague here at Yale, Ken Gillingham, did a wonderful study finding that as soon as one home uh, owner puts solar panels on their roof in a neighborhood, the odds go up that another home in that neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof. And once that second homeowner puts solar panels on their roof, the odds go up yet again that another person will put solar panels on their roof. That isn't necessarily because neighbors are actually talking to one another. It's the social signal that is shown uh, by that activity where people can see that someone like them is deciding to adopt this new technology. So those social norms are absolutely critical. Fourth is political behavior. Will the public support or oppose uh, policies to address climate change? Will they support a higher price on carbon or not? What policies are politically feasible? That will include voting behavior. Will citizens prefer candidates that are climate champions and vote out of office those that are blocking progress? There's public participation in community planning and decision-making. What kinds of communities do we want to live in? How can we participate in the design and implementation of those plans? And increasingly important, how can we protect ourselves from ever more severe climate impacts? And then last but not least is advocacy behavior. Will we not just support climate action, but demand it from our leaders? And this includes everything from petitions and donations and volunteering with advocacy organizations to citizens directly pressuring government officials and company leaders. So my point is really just that all of these human decisions, all of these choices, all of these behaviors will collectively determine the fate of the planet. That's why we care what the public thinks, what the public feels, and what the public does about climate change. Public sentiment shapes the social, cultural, and political climate of climate change, enabling or constraining climate action. So our second big question then is, what is the role of communication in climate action? How do we inform, persuade, and enlist public sentiment? So communication, along with the opposable thumb, is one of the key capabilities of the human species. Communication has enabled humanity to build this incredibly sophisticated and powerful civilization that is now literally reshaping the planet. Communication is how we share ideas and emotions, stories, experiences, science, and culture from one person to another, from one person to millions, and from millions back to one person. From the first engraved clay tablets thousands of years ago to Gutenberg's printing press 
to TikTok, we now have the ability to communicate at enormous speed and scale. And today, communication is central to solving the climate crisis. We only know about climate change because of the communications between thousands of scientists around the world who've been conducting climate research for more than 150 years. The other nearly 8 billion of us only know about climate change because these scientific findings, those insights, have been communicated to the rest of us. We're now at the dawn of a new age in not just communication, but scientific communication research, behavioral research, which can now be conducted at a global scale. So now let's turn to our third big question, how are publics around the world thinking and feeling about climate change? So we recently conducted a survey in using data from 192 countries and territories worldwide in partnership with Data for Good at Meta conducted on the Facebook platform. While it's not strictly a representative survey, it is representative of the views of the three and a half billion people worldwide who use Facebook and Instagram, et cetera, which in many countries provides a, a, actually quite a good estimate of national public opinion, while in less developed countries it represents the views of the online population, which tends to be better educated and with higher incomes. But overall, this does provide us with a unique global data set of public climate change beliefs, risk perceptions, policy support, and behavior. I'm just going to share just a few key quick findings. One of the most important things that we've learned, and this actually aligns with work we did over 10 years ago with the Gallup World Poll, is that there's still a huge divide in terms of just even basic awareness of climate change. So the darker red is where you have large majorities of a country that has heard of climate change, whereas darker blue are those countries where it's less than 50% have ever heard of climate change. Now, one of the key things that we've learned is that People in the developed world are overwhelmingly aware of this issue, but there are still many people, we think at least over a billion people worldwide who've essentially never heard of climate change before. Despite all of the science, despite all the media coverage, despite all the geopolitical meetings about the issue, you still have many, many people who've never heard of it. And of course, they're often some of the most vulnerable people in the world. Now, I am not, uh, let me quickly say that that just because they've never heard of climate change doesn't mean they're not keenly aware of changes in their local climates. We know that they are. In some of our in-depth work, we see this very directly, where they basically say uh, they're well that they're keenly aware that uh, there's changes in their local temperatures, in precipitation, in uh, uh, growing seasons, et cetera. And they're deeply worried about them because their lives literally depend on these. But what they lack is the concept of climate change to understand why these things are happening. And even more importantly, they lack the concept of climate change to inform their future decisions. And these are societies that are making huge bets about the future. Where are we gonna build all these new cities that are gonna house tens of millions of people? Where do we site our roads and our bridges and our hospitals and our schools? To what tolerances should we be building? What crops are we gonna grow in our country? If you're making those kinds of decisions, without the idea, without the concept of climate change in mind, you're probably making bad bets because as human beings, we tend to assume that the future climate is going to look like the past. But if there's one thing we understand about climate change is that the future is absolutely not going to look like the past. So big picture here, there is still an, a basic need to, uh, to raise basic awareness about climate change in many parts of the world, particularly the most vulnerable. But the good news is that it doesn't actually take very much. So what we find is that all we have to do is give people a one sentence description of what climate change is and how it affects uh, weather patterns. And immediately we see more than eight out of 10 people worldwide say immediately, yes, this is happening. Yes, I'm worried about it. Yes, I support my government taking action. We don't find major political or ideological barriers with the exception of countries like my own, Canada, Australia, and, and the United Kingdom to a lesser extent. Um, so it's really just a matter of, of informing and engaging people and they will be here uh, to uh, and, and recognize the threat that uh, we all face. However, when it comes to perceiving that threat, here's the other major pattern we see is again, this kind of now it's an inverted pattern where it's the people in the developing world who say, who perceive climate change as a direct personal threat. It will harm them personally. Whereas by contrast, it's people in the wealthier countries who say, generally that they still think of climate change as distant. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, or distant in space, 
They, many people still think it's about polar bears or developing countries, but not my country, not my community, not my friends, not my family, not me. And as a result, it's still for many people psychologically distant. It's one of a hundred other issues that's out there in the world. They don't yet understand why this is so important, why this is so urgent that we take action. So another major communication challenge is still to help people better appreciate, especially in the developed world, uh, the risks that we all face. And we also find that generally everywhere, there's still a lot to be done in even helping people understand the, that this is human cost. And this is critically important because for those people who say, okay, it's happening, but it's natural, they generally assume that the world gets warmer, the world will get colder, we didn't have anything to do with it. We can't do anything about it. And they don't understand thus why we need to do things like stop burning fossil fuels, reducing carbon pollution, putting a price on carbon and all the other kinds of policy actions that we need to do. So there is still a critical need to communicate this fundamental scientific fact that this is human caused. Um, then when it comes to the kinds of energy that we use, we see again, this very uh, big developed versus developing world split where we have uh, strong majorities pretty much everywhere in the developed world saying that my country in the future should use less fossil fuels. That basic uh, conclusion has already been widely adopted uh, across the world. But then you see in much of the developing world, uh, people saying, no, I actually want more fossil fuel use in my country. And we think that's because of at least two key things. One, they don't understand that climate change is caught. Well, they don't understand climate change and they also don't understand that climate change is caused by the burning of those fossil fuels. And secondly, as you all know what better than I do, it's energy poverty. If you don't have electricity, if you don't have all the kinds of uh, energy uh, capabilities that we have in the developed world, people want this in their own lives as well. So they are basically saying we want more energy. But on the good news, we see that overwhelmingly everywhere, people say we want more renewable energy in our country. And so this really is the transition that point that we're all heading towards. And the good news is that we have consensus pretty much everywhere in the world that this is the desirable future. And then also really importantly is just how often do we hear about climate change in our local media? And what you see is that pretty much most in most parts of the world, people rarely hear about it. I mean, even hearing about it once a week is really not all that often. Just think about how much you've probably seen about the Queen's funeral over the past couple of weeks as compared to the how many times you've seen climate change in the news media. And again, when we don't talk about this issue, when we don't hear about it, many people just forget it, that you know, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Even if they're, they do think it's a problem, it doesn't seem as pressing as the other things that are on the top of the media agenda. So this is still a critical communication need. So to conclude, mitigating, preparing for, and adapting to climate change will require not just smart policy or economics or technological innovation, but different decisions and behaviors by eight to 10 billion human beings. It's an incumbent on all of us to communicate with, engage, and empower our friends, our families, our fellow citizens, and our leaders to build public and political will for climate action. So thank you again for the invitation to join you today. Uh, all of our information, all of our data is available on our website. So if you're at all interested in following up on any of these kinds of uh, results, just come visit. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. It certainly left us with a big task and, and showing us the importance of the work that we do as a program and policy developers for governments around the world. Um, I'd like to just take a second before we close to say thank you to all the speakers, uh, those that presented some of their experiences as program and policy deliverers in governments. Um, educators and researchers uh, and, um, and industry practitioners as well. It has been certainly very interesting and we have a, a great range of advice to take um, now with us into the work that we do as the Energy Efficiency Working Party. Thank you to all those who've joined us online. Uh, I hope you found this very interesting and to the Energy Efficiency Working Party members for being here with us in Paris and obviously to the IEA Secretariat uh, for putting this together. 
uh, a great lineup of speakers and, and presenters. And um, we're looking forward to the next session in March. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.